This is the Literary Licensed Podcast, coming at you from Collingsport, Maine. Discussing strange goings-on in the world of the Collins family, with your hosts, Tom Damon, Vicky Ray, and Keith Chorgo, bring you daytime drama fear from the past into your present. Tory Winters. Collinwood has a reputation for ghosts and specters and the unseen widows who weep for their men missing at sea. I had always scoffed at these ghost stories until last night. Hear the devil call out my name Broken promises burning flame Literary License Podcast. Today we'll be discussing Dark Shadows, episodes 72 to 91. And with us today we have Tom Diamond. Hello, Tom. <laughs> Happy Halloween, everybody. Hope all is <laughs> we're doing well. I thought I'd just give you a little scare there. <laughs> and we have Vicky Ray, the Queen of the Witches. <laughs> right. Hello. Hi, everybody. <laughs> And we have Marcel Kishago. So before we get started, let's find out what everyone's been up to. So, Vicky, what have you been up to since last time we spoke to you? Well, seeing as it hasn't been that long since I spoke to you, not a whole lot. We're just uh, getting ready for Halloween. We had my grandson's birthday, and we're going to have a party next weekend. Um, I watched this movie last night that reminded me of something you would watch. It was called Five Girls on Netflix. Oh, yes, I like that film. Yeah, I kind of figured. And I watched Eli, like you suggested, was not expecting the end that I saw. It was a really excellent movie. And I watched this movie with Dee Wallace called Red Christmas. I can't get an hour and 50 minutes of my life back, but it was entertaining anyway. (laughs) And then I watched that because you guys got me into the Spanish horror lately. I watched Influences. 
Mm -hmm. And it was really, really good. It was dubbed, but it was really, really well done. And it was, it was actually scared the shit out of me a few times. <laughs> and it takes and a it, lot to do that, but it was an excellent movie. Other than that, just doing the family thing. And Influence is available on Netflix, is that correct? Yes, yes. And Tom, what about yourself? What have you been up to since last time we spoke to you? Quiet month, but uh, two things I would definitely recommend that are coming out. Um, Lost in Space, season two. Yeah, I saw that one. That was good. I like yeah, that. yeah. Season two is starting, I believe, on December 24th on Netflix, which just happens to be my birthday. And uh, Ooh, so, happy birthday. Nice birthday. Was that? Was that? Happy birthday. Thank happy you. Birthday. Thank you. No songs are necessary. That's okay. How old am I now? Anyway, so, uh, and the other thing is The Man in the High Castle. And that's going to be, uh, that's on Amazon Prime. And the last season is starting, uh, I believe, in the middle of November. And Man in the High Castle, I have really, really enjoyed. It's an alternate history, uh, originally the novel by Philip K. Dick, in uh, terms of what the Germans had won World War II, alternate history stuff. Really, really gripping. And I'm only sorry this is going to be the last season. I'm looking forward to that. Mm. And myself, um, I've been watching Modern Love, which is available on Amazon Prime, and which is very, very good. It's basically individual stories with a really fantastic cast that you no wouldn't normally get in a series. But it's like it's basically a set of like thirty minutes short stories about love in the modern age, which is very, very heartwarming and sweet, and sometimes can put a little tear in one's eye. Even to the hardened bastard that I am, I still get a tear to my eye every once in a while. Oh, please. <laughs> really? And, make the foo-foo sign here at any moment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then um, on Netflix, I've been watching the Paul Rudd series, um, How to How to Live with One, How to Live with Yourself. Excellent. Highly recommend it. it. It's eight episodes. Each episode is about 23 minutes long, and it's so bizarre. He plays... Basically, the um, story is, is that he's a really horrible person, and he's been offered a free coupon to this spa, and then he wakes up in a grave, he digs himself out, and kind of find out he's been cloned. And the clone is oh, no. the, best, the, best ver the best version of him, and then there's him, and what happened... What you know, pandemonium pursues, so that's very good. And other than that, just been catching some stuff up on Amazon. Of course, the new Shutter series, Creep Show, which I highly suggest. Oh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Very, very good. So, I guess this brings us into Dark Shadows, episode 72 to 91. So, Tom, what are your tidbits about this Episodes. Well, first, well, first, uh, three quick things uh, in the Dark Shadows world. Uh, James Storm who, uh, will come on later as Gerard Styles uh, got married, uh, and a lot of the fans know this on August twenty fourth. So we just want to give a shout out uh, both to him and his bride Valerie, uh, and they are currently on an extended honeymoon. And uh, Jim has also been interviewed uh, for us. And that will come also at a later time in the podcast. Uh, the next thing, Chris Pennock. Chris Pennock. Uh, also later on, he's one of the actors who plays Jeb, John Yeager, et cetera, et cetera, various characters. I don't want to give too much of a spoiler. Uh, he and his wife just renewed their marriage vows after 30 years of marriage. And they did that, uh, I think, earlier this week. So, uh, once again, congratulations to uh, Chris Pennock. And finally, there will be a documentary regarding Jonathan Frid, he who, shall, he who he will be named later on, the star of Dark Shadows, uh, coming up. And Mary O'Leary, who was his personal manager and also has been interviewed by us, is chairing that. That will be released by MPI early 2020. So uh, I'm sure we're all looking forward to that, as far as that's concerned. Now, getting to Dark Shadows, uh, the bloopers, not a lot this time. Uh, and, and interestingly enough, I think that, I don't know, in my, in my opinion, that kind of detracts a little bit. I, I, kind of enjoy seeing the, I kind of enjoy seeing the bloopers, and that always makes things a little more fun. And of course, on the other side, they're doing technical accuracy, and uh, you'll see a long spate of shows. However, you still have 
uh, the drawing room of Collinwood, and uh, then the camera sidles up and you see the Klieg lights. And uh, there's a scene in one of the episodes, uh, you can catch that, where Vicky is uh, talking to, I believe, Carolyn in her room. You see a mirror behind Vicky and you see a light behind that. And the, the big catch-all, I think, has to do with, uh, and this is very interesting, episode 88, where Burke Devlin is, has bought the Logansport cannery. And there's that little business episode where he calls in the uh, people from the Collinsport cannery. And he's talking to them. And uh, the head guy is a character by the name of Amos Fitch. And uh, he is only there for one time. And uh, it's a one day, it's a one day episode. And he is played by a, an actor by the name of George Matthews. Now, let's see if you can catch this reference. Now, George Matthews uh, was on a show and this is probably one of the weirdest crossovers uh, to another show that I can think of for Dark Shadows, The Honeymooners. Hey, how many of you, you guys remember The Honeymooners? Jackie Gleason. Yep. Absolutely. Do you get that in England, Keith? Um, well, I grew up in America, so we got, got it there. But Honeymooners is actually pretty big here in the UK. And, of course, The Honeymooners was spin off. The Flintstones. That's right. Absolutely. Well, if you remember... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, hey, you know that, all right. So now I'm gonna say so now, isn't that in the honeymooners? In that, um, one of these days, pow, right in the kisser. That's it, that, that's, that's it, that's, honeymooners, that's yeah. it, that's Ralph, that's Ralph for yeah. you, Jackie Gleason, Audrey Meadows. Uh, uh, um, Jackie Gleason, God, uh, Joyce Randolph as Trixie, who by the way celebrated her 95th birthday earlier this week. She's the only cool. one cool. that is still alive. And of course, mm-hmm. the late the great Art Carney. Anyway, the episode you may remember an episode, uh, and I'll give you, and I'll give you. Do you remember the name Harvey from one of the episodes? Okay, so I, that's him. yeah, Harvey. That's, yeah, I do because I was I was thinking of James Stewart the Rabbit when I said Harvey every time I heard Okay, Harvey. well that's yeah, well, no, this is another Harvey. So he's in the pool hall, uh, and he's trying to get a he's trying to get a table, and he and Ralph decides to bully this little guy, this short little fella. And uh, this guy says, I have, but you can't do that to me. My friend Harvey will take him. And Harvey walks into the room. That is George Matthews, who is on Dark Shadows. And uh-huh. Harvey went, I don't like that, Ralph. I think I'm going to break your face. And it's true. They all have Brooklyn accents on that show. Uh, mm-hmm. Which uh, So this is the first time I think you really have somebody with a Brooklyn accent on Dark Shadows who stood up to Liz and Roger. So that is the big, that is the big deal uh, for for this block. Ooh, so I guess that brings us to synopsis. So Vicky, <laughs> the synopsis is on you. Ready, set, and go. Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> <laughs> Carolyn, on pursuit of her daddy issues, shows her jealous streak as she confronts Victoria once again while sleeping Joe out in the cold. Burke, while finds a way to ostracize everyone who doesn't go along with Bill Malloy's court's death by accident verdict. Uh, Roger decides to take Vicky out for drinks at the Blue Whale, where they spot Joe having a drink with Sam and Maggie. Roger runs home to squeal on Joe to an already jealously fueled <laughs> Carolyn, who doesn't seem to grasp that she is doing the same dirty on Joe herself. Carolyn confronts Joe and breaks it off with him. Joe has dinner with Maggie, and they share a moment as sparks begin to ignite. Carolyn goes on a jealous rampage about how Joe has done her wrong, and Vicky rationalizes Carolyn's actions to her. Throughout this drama, Vicky finds the pen Burke gave to Carolyn on the cliffs of Widow's Hill. She values the pen that doesn't write to the annoyance of Roger, who wants it back. <laughs> <laughs> David is doing his millennial impression and getting away with his self-titled horrendous behavior. He locks Victoria into a room in the closed-off part of the house where Victoria pleads to deaf ears to be let out. Bill Malloy's ghost appears and warns her to leave as she is in danger. Roger opens a secret door and wanders aimlessly until he finds that room that Victoria is locked in after banging about and putting on a ghostly voice. Victoria says she wants to leave Collingwood, much to Roger's delight, until David begs her not to go due to her sighting of Malloy's ghost. Roger finally gives David a good slap. 
The audience cheers, but Elizabeth is not amused. Roger and Elizabeth goes to where Victoria was locked in to discover wet seaweed on the floor, left the night before. I kind of think it should have been dried out then. The seaweed leaves then baffled them. The seaweed leaves that baffled them. How it could still be wet after so many hours doesn't raise concerns as it might be due to the mildew of the locked off rooms. <laughs> Victoria is deciding to st- Victoria decides to stay and that she's going to jump back on the Betty Haskins bus of who is my mother and take a few days off to Banger. Hot to trot, Carolyn takes her to the coffee shop while sneaking in a call to Burke. Burke joins them and cancels with Carolyn so he could take Victoria to Banger. Carolyn goes crying home to mommy and hates Victoria due to her ongoing jealous streak. Burke uses the charm. <laughs> Burke, using the charm, threatens Victoria, making a most uncomfortable road journey. The episodes close with the world wondering why Carolyn wants to be with the ever so warm and easygoing Burke. <laughs> did, you realize, did you realize that when you said uh, Burke took Victoria to Banger? Uh, yeah, I know. I think it was worded it. that way on purpose. So that's I said, Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> Well, that's great. No, that was a, that was on his mind. But you know, Victoria's a good girl. If girl, if Victoria just had a little bit of sensibility that Carolyn had, it would have happened. So no kidding, Burke. You know, I'm surprised Burke hasn't you know tried to, to get after them really because he's just playing kissy face. And you know, Burke does not come across to me as a virgin or you know a well defined gentleman you know he's kind of almost Rhett Butlerish in a lot of ways well yeah he's a ladies man isn't he yeah turning turning on the devilish charms yeah Burke Devlin with the devilish charms and then one I have to sit there and say this um this month is one of those months and Dark Shadows does have this and you know as we get further into it they do have these like weird months where like not a lot happens they give you just a little bit of information because you know this you know, you know the storyline's going to move forward from the little piece of information. But it's almost like the writer's going, okay, we need to regroup now. Let's figure out where we're going. Okay, well, we're just going to keep, we need to keep the show going, so we'll just keep going until we figure out exactly where we're going with it. And well, I, I think, think after that big revelation uh, which uh, of the coroner's report, which it only took 20 episodes uh, to come across <laughs> with, uh, and, you know, they all said, well, okay, now it's an accidental death by drowning, and so now you can devote a couple of episodes to Roger dancing for joy and running to Widow's Hill and smelling the fresh air and uh, and having that wonderful and then of course uh, Vicky gets locked in the room for another week uh, she gets she locked goes. into everything everywhere wherever she goes somebody's holding well let's be honest about this room I mean what is this room okay it's in the locked off part of the house mm-hmm. now when the house was fully open and fully functional with all the maids and the servants and people coming and going in the parties could you imagine being given this like you know this is the room you're going to sleep in the one with the bars on the window yeah. <laughs> Like, what the hell? <laughs> you know, you're like two or three story. I mean, you know, I guess we're about two or three stories up, but we're not quite sure. We know it takes Roger a long time to go up and down the same staircase to get to this room. <laughs> but uh, but you're thinking to yourself, it's like, why is there bars on the window? Because obviously it's on the second or third floor. <laughs> it's like, what, and then, what, what, and, out? Then, and then Roger, you know, starts, you know, he's he decides to give her a little extra push by pretending he's a ghost. I know, what an uh, asshole. Don't you love Roger? Of, <laughs> <laughs> not one of his finer... I love Louis Edmonds. <laughs> yeah. I, I love Louis Edmonds, but that was not one of his finer moments, you know? <laughs> yeah, He's such an asshole. Collinwood, Vicky! Leave Collinwood! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he had to sit there. That one scene was so... It's, it's like they're building up the tension and the music's building. And it's like he opens up the secret door and he goes up, he goes down, up the stairs. Staircase. He goes down the staircase. He goes up the staircase. He goes on the roundabout staircase, and then he comes out there. And all of a sudden, like, and he like looks around, and all of a sudden, he starts knocking things over. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Leave Collingwood. <laughs> well, the thing is, is like he, th- and this is what quite was also quite humorous about the thing because he, then he goes, you know, leave Collingwood, and then instead of like leaving and coming back like a couple hours later, because he opens make, he goes, the door. He goes, hi, is that you, Vicky? <laughs> Like right afterwards, and Vicky's like, "Oh my god, I think I heard something." It's like, really, Vicky, you couldn't put this together. <laughs> oh shit! Oh my I god, that's too way. funny. 
correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that is, by the way, the first time we see the secret door in the drawing room being opened. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's a, so that's a dubious distinction and, uh, and, and a nice little touch. One thing I also forgot to mention in terms of the bloopers, and I think it's a, it's a, it, the blue whale, you see some guy dancing across the camera by himself. He just goes, lurches forward, mm -hmm. and he reminds me, I don't know if you remember the Woody Allen film, Love and Death, he reminds me of the village Indian, mm -hmm. just like running across the floor and dancing while you have, you know, while you, while you have that. But uh, I think that, you know, I, I think that's, that, that's one of the few uh, nice spots. The show obviously gets better, but there obviously were, you know, there obviously was, were slow, uh, points as 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 you went as you yeah. went. I mean even in its heyday they, there are, I mean we'll get to them. I mean there's some like bum months that go on. But I mean to be honest, I mean there's what I did notice about this um scope of thingies is that the writing was better. The writing did get better. Yes. I mean unfortunately what we got with the good writing was characters who had who last month that we discussed grew as person people and then this one they kind of reverted back to what they were a couple months ago which is kind of weird because you kind of like you got like david's like david was kind of mellowing out and he's like growing and all of a sudden now we got david flopping back to the horrible child that he was two months ago so that and then you got carolyn like carolyn's growing a little bit and then you know she's gonna stick her family side and all of a sudden now she's gone back to being the jealous brat again don't you think so, vicky got a popper I mean, literally, just like she always jumps her shit at like any given moment, especially with Burke Devil and just like, you know, but he did kind of blow her off. He just decides like, oh, let's just take a trip to Banger, you know? Well, between you and me, Victoria, <laughs> Doesn't between you and me, Carolyn. <laughs> between you and me, Victoria, Victoria always has the better bra on than Carolyn. Carolyn's, oh my I God, know, don't so, even get me going. <laughs> sometimes it's like, it's like Carolyn, I don't know if it's the clothes that she's wearing or what. Like, sometimes like, like, the bras back then were, were designed to give you missile tits back then, which I find really unattractive with the big points. It's just like, well, no. Victoria, Victoria has the, bu the bullet bra on but carolyn i think is more 60s oh not terrell kind of bra because this is like one day i mean i think there's like two two or three episodes that one's higher than the other you're like and she's like wearing this like dress she goes and don't i look pretty she's got her hair all up and she's wearing this black dress and this black dress does nothing for her it's like i know it's it, it just, like, it just it's like, it looked like a cloth fat and i thought oh poor carolyn She's going to try to pull that in. And a she has a girl. She's very but let's crazy. not remember. Let's also remember that this is the entrance of Mrs. Johnson now. Uh, Who needs a new wig? Yeah, she's wearing Norman Bates' mom's wig. <laughs> <laughs> like, I swear to God, episode 72, I swear to God, she's making the phone call from the phone booth. And it looked to me like there was a bobby pin holding, holding up. Probably a was. Yeah, was it? Was Probably. it? Probably. Because I, you saw the light. You saw, it was glinting. You saw the glinting. Or the her, it might be holding. It might be holding her um, Jackie Ken, Jackie O's um, pill pill, hat, pill box <laughs> hat on. Because <laughs> it's like it's, it's very rare that you see a pill box hat setting on the back of a bun. Because <laughs> here she is wearing know, Norman Bates' mom's wig, and then she's got the Jackie O um, pill hat, and then it's like, and then it kind of got the, and then sometimes it's. Sometimes she doesn't have a center. Sometimes it's like to the left or to the right. So it's never very centered, is it, the wig? I think that wig, I mean, everybody else has got some nice little hair tufts that they wear that look fairly natural. And then you get to her, it's just like, they, you know, it's like, don't cheap, cheap out on me, you know? Just get, get the woman a decent wig. You know, well, she I does. She looks very good in tweed. I have to give her that. She does look good in tweed. She's very good looking tweed. I have to sit there and say though that she's quite funny because she thinks that she's like so clever and it's like, she, but she's so like, you know, like the fight that she has with Burke. It's like, it's just like I don't <laughs> like you. <laughs> but she's like, where did that come from? <laughs> it's like, yeah. and, every, and you can see like Maggie going, where the hell did that come from? <laughs> But Burke's been manipulating her all along. And, I feel bad for her because Burke just dumped her off in the friggin' haunted mansion. And she's got to deal with all the bullshit that's going on in there. I don't even think she even knew what was coming when she moved into that place to spy. Yeah, well, we don't actually... I mean, these episodes, she doesn't even move in. I mean, the next... I mean, I have... I have because we're doing two episodes next month of Dark Shadows, is like I started a bit early because normally I wait till we finish this recording yeah. this year and then I start. But knowing that we got two months, like 
it's gonna be like a heavy month of Dark Shadows episodes yep. that started. Yep. So. Absolutely. But um One but I have to there say she 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 is she is such an asset to the show, though. I do love she her. Is. She's she's like yeah, that pesky, you know. She's like Ur, you know, Ethel, not Ethel Mertz, but who's the Gladys? Gladys Kravitz, Gladys Kravitz. from Bewitch. <laughs> she's she's like the exactly. gra- gra- always got her nose in people's business. Thinks she's really clever, but she's like so, you know, so you know, opaque that <laughs> you see right through her. <laughs> <laughs> I like her. I think she's pretty cool. Oh, she's excellent. And of course, mm-hmm. later on, you're going to see her in her Mrs. Danvers outfit. She graduates from the tweet. Uh, but that's going to be, uh, the, the, again, it's going to be much later. You know, I was going to talk to you about David. And uh, what a real psychotic. I think they did a really brilliant piece of writing when David comes up to Vicky and says, I love you, Vicky, uh, which <laughs> is when he wants her to stay. And then Vicky says to Carolyn, did you ever hear her, him say that he loved anybody before? He right. <laughs> yes, it was with a cat that he owned when we were living in Augusta. Uh, and, and so what happened? He goes, well, he oh, said he wow. loved the cat and then he, and then he drowned it. And then he yeah. Said, <laughs> <laughs> and then, da, da, da. You know, that was yeah. really funny. You know, I think David was separated at birth from Will Robinson from um, Lost in Space. <laughs> I think they were separated <laughs> at birth. David they look like twins. Lost in space. <laughs> they yeah. do look remarkably like. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have to also say about Bert Devlin's character. He really goes around it the wrong way. It seems like, you know, for someone who's quite accomplished and he's made all this money. When five, I mean, he gets thrown out of jail with no money. In five years time, he's made a fortune. You think that he would have figured out how to work people, but he has a habit of ostracizing everybody he comes across. It's like, but well, it is. Episode 76 is my favorite episode. It's, I call it, I've come for Collinwood episode because that's what Burke does when he, he just strides into, I've come for Collinwood. And, and, and he does that throughout this block in every way, shape imaginable, trying to push Sheriff Patterson around. Uh, you know, running after, who, who uh, having the fights with Liz and threatening, you know, and actually coming out and saying, "I'm going to get everything, and you guys might as well sell me what you have." And uh, that, that that they really played very well off against each other, Mitch Ryan. Mm-hmm. I think he just got a big chip on his shoulder. He gets pissed off, someone sure. sent him to jail, and he didn't do it, and he knows he did it, and no one's believing him. It's like, hey, here I am. I do think, though, if he had if he had a slightly different approach, I think he probably we probably he, we probably would be to you know where we are when we get to episode one hundred and twenty. We would be there by now. <laughs> exactly. But his, but his approach is kind of like. Really? I mean, even like the thing is like, okay, he likes Vicky a lot. I mean, he just threatens her in the car and, he, and she's just sitting there going, mm, okay. whatever. Yeah. Um, can you let me out here? <laughs> Almost kind of thing. But, you know, it's just, it's just kind of strange, this character. I mean, he's brilliant, you know, as, as far as the character goes. There's something really menacing about him. And well, I think Vicky, that... Mm-hmm. Vicky is definitely you know, his preference. Uh, but, uh, you know, of course, the whole revenge seems to be the whole focus of his personality. Uh, he just wants it all. And I think that's how he uh, basically comes off. Mm-hmm. I do I do that to say the most irritating thing about this block of episodes is Carolyn's action. She comes across as a real spoiled rich girl. And yeah. It, and it gets to the point where it's kind of like, oh. Really, and I, I, I guess there's there's parts of this where I don't really like too much. Where it's just like she goes running home to her mom and is like, eh, 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 you know, like, She's like I don't like Victoria or anything like this. And then then the way she treats yeah. Joe, and then and then Burke, you know, and then it's like, eh, 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 eh. So, and is this the way that her character keeps jumping back and forth? And I do think that. It's almost like the writers didn't know really what they go like, okay, we need to use Carolyn because we're paying her. So we got to do have something for her to do. And it's kind of like, we're going to keep her in this kind of weird storyline that doesn't really, it's not, it's not really going anywhere. It's not really progressing anything. It's almost like. It's not really doing much for the show actually, but it's kind of, she's not my, well, I don't get into it, but she's not my favorite character of these episodes. Just let's put it that way. Yeah. I mean, those are the kind of girls we used to beat up in school. <laughs> I, mean, she, I, mean, I mean, I know that when we get future into further episodes, I mean, her, her as an actress really begins to shine. And come yeah, absolutely. Out. But the part of Carolyn is 
so far, there's not much to like about the character itself. I just find her, she's manipulative. She uses people to her advantage. She's, she's, not, she's not a very good friend to have. She's, especially Joe. Especially Joe, Joe because he pushes that. him around, boy. <laughs> and he finally, and he finally gets some guts. And of course, this is really in this block of episodes. But this is really the first time you see what is beginning to be a developing relationship between Joe and Maggie. Yeah. That was Joe a lovely, finally that was a lovely time, though. Um, that was done so well. the The chemistry between Maggie and Joe is fantastic. Yeah, it really yeah. sparks off. You know, they have the dinner, and then and then there's that one scene where she talks about the ships. And the different yeah, that's a great scene. Like this. That's the, the, and, sail, the sailing. I don't know how Catherine Lane Scott, she memorized that beautifully when she's mm-hmm. talking about the jib and the jab and the double jibs and the double jab. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know if I'd be able to do that. I think that was absolutely, of course, Joe is knocked out. He's absolutely impressed. Well, he's and, a simple kind of guy, and she's, I mean, there's just no no fluff and no, no fluff, no muss or whatever, but, you know, with these guys. They're just down to earth, your basic people, and, you know, they're not living high atop the hill in the in the haunted mansion these people are like more grounded and that's probably why they find more camaraderie with each other and chemistry well they're the townies aren't they yeah you know they're the townies and the townies are different from the collinses there's always a separation i mean it's quite sad because i don't know if there's any other young men for any of these people to date (laughs) it seems like joe's the only if you're a young girl all the only choice you have is joe (laughs) because there doesn't be anybody else well there's the the blue whale uh, and there's that one scene where Maggie and Joe and Sam, well, when is it Sam drinking? That was a nice scene as well. They're yeah, about you know, they're drinking the to the Collinses. Or yes, 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 yes. But I love the way Catherine Lee Scott pulls it. She's, she's looking at Joe and she says, oh, I'm interested in you. And you see all those, all those, like, she's making eyes at them and everything. And, you know, and she's just so, Catherine Lee Scott is so pretty doing that mm. stuff. Uh, it's, a, it's, just a, it's just it's just like what you you know that she's interested in him, and and well, he is like, yeah. who me? You know that kind of thing because he's still uh, wondering if Carolyn is going to be there. Before, well, but what's Carolyn waiting for exactly? She doesn't you know. know. She doesn't, she doesn't know. know. I mean, the thing is, is like she's looking. Carolyn's the kind of person that wants to have an exciting life, and she knows that if she settles down with Joe, it's going to be. It's gonna be like Belle from Beauty and the Beast, you know. It's like she knows, you know, and basically it's just gonna be a whole home life, and she's wanting something to be more exciting. She wants something that she, you know, a fairy tale kind of a romance, and something exciting and daring and a bit dirty. And Joe is like clean and safe and town, you know, a townie. Oh, is he, I and, think and that's he's why saying- that's why the relationship never really made sense anyway. I mean, I think we mentioned it on previous episodes where their relationship doesn't really make a lot of sense. Yeah, it's kind of doomed from the get go. As you I mean, said, you, yeah, you said that in one of the other episodes. They really weren't quite right for each other. I mean, and, could you picture them married and what their married life would be? Could you be picture her to be divorced inside of a year? Yeah, I mean, it'd be like Carolyn. You know, they're living in a small house, probably a trailer, and uh, <laughs> Carolyn's darning his socks <laughs> with her th- pregnant with a third child. Why Joe's coming in smelling of fish? I mean, I just can't see it. <laughs> But but one thing, and I think it was a writer's glitch, because I thought they had promoted Joe uh, to an inside office job, uh, but all of a sudden they're talking him, uh, they're saying he's a fisherman. And, he wants uh, his own boat, though. He wants. He doesn't yeah. want to be wants working his own for boat. anybody else. He, he wants does, to have his okay. own deal going on. Maybe that's what they were talking about because they had promoted him to an inside job, and he was working for Bill Malloy. And but then, but here they talk about him being a fisherman, and maybe that maybe that's what Joe always wanted to be, and mm. that, that's probably it. Well, he's just a hometown simple boy, which is like, you know, he's one of these people that's very good looking, but eventually he'll have a beer gut and. He'll probably come home and start beating his wife. Like, you know, that's what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Wear the, the white tank top with the green stain on it. With the beer in one hand, a slap in the other, with the white beater on. <laughs> but later we find out that Joe goes to New York City and joins the village people. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but, so, um, so we mustn't forget Bill Malloy's ghost. No. That, that was well done, actually. I think they yeah, did a really good job too. there. Mm-hmm. There was that eeriness to it. The buildup was very, very well. And I like I like the fact that 
Victoria was half asleep when she woke up. So therefore, there's, there is that question up until they find the seaweed on the floor, uh, whether that it's her, is she in a half dream super, is she in a dreamlike state? Because the way they filmed it, they had this dreamlike quality to it as well. Right. So is it, was it like, well, did she see this? Was it reality? So we were left with a bit of, you know, wondering for two episodes of whether she did see it, like all the other characters, did you really see this or not? Until we see the seaweed, then we actually realized it was actually part of her reality. So I like that. You really see that they're starting to dip their foot in the water once again, because Josette was really the first ghost that they worked with. But now they're starting to, well, let's see if we can do this with someone, with someone else. And uh, they brought, and of course, the Bill Malloy fan club was thrilled that he, you know, that he came back uh, the way he did. And, and the whole experience was very frightening for Vicky, but, I mean, it was like incredible. It's like they go into this room and there's, oh, gee, now I understand why she must have had such a, why she was so frightened, you know, they're going into this room. It's like, oh, it wasn't such a big deal that she was locked up. But then when they look at the room, they're, they're saying, oh, my God, you know, there's kind of, kind of, I don't know, cognitive dissonance or something like that. I, you know, I don't know. Do people ever put out the candles in this house? I mean, they have candles lit <laughs> everywhere. I mean, are they not afraid of a goddamn fire? <laughs> Well, like I mean, I think the Collins family actually verge on hoarding because they don't look like they throw anything away. I mean, in that one room that Victoria was, there's a stack of newspapers all tied together. Like, what are they saving these newspapers for? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And then you have a spiral staircase to get up to it, even though you've already gone upstairs. That must so, have been fun for Louis Edmonds to climb. Is this like an attic room or is this... You know. I have no idea. I mean, I have to sit there and say that we finally get a little bit of the scope of how big this house is. I think Liz we... mentioned it as part of the eaves above the house. So maybe that is kind of like an attic kind of thing. Well, another thing is if they're going up a spiral staircase, I mean, when they show the outside of Collinswood anyway, isn't there like a tower building? Are there towers on both sides? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so <laughs> maybe, maybe she's up in one of the tower rooms. Yeah, there's quite a few. Well, there's one there. tower room that we definitely, but we're not going to know about that till later on. Later, yeah. Yeah. So you do have to wonder what the what the window has bars on. Who are they locking in, or who do they not want to escape from that room? <laughs> I know it's such a creepy place. I mean, it's just everything about it is so oppressing or oppressive. I, I, that's probably one of the reasons Carolyn wants to get out of there. Vicky just seems to want to stay. I guess she likes oppression in her life. Well, well I mean, Vi yeah, Victoria, I mean, this is, the, yeah, go ahead. this is the only home that Victoria knows, though, really. I mean, she's never had a home before, does she? Even though no, no one wants her in the home. But, you know, this is her only home home. Yeah. Before that, she was, a, she was an orphanage, Every, wasn't she? Everybody keeps telling her to leave. So it's like, yeah, it's her home home. But everybody wants her to leave. <laughs> that woman should have a complex by she's now. Got, she's, she's a governess to this hateful Adderall ridden child, or he should be. Well, she was going to leave after she was locked in the room by the kid. I'm surprised she didn't pack up the next morning. And then, of course, you know, she said, well, I'll she leave. She saw a ghost, time. though. Yeah, she saw the ghost. Yes, yes. And the time period has only been three weeks since she arrived. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's getting into the second. <laughs> yeah, well, she's had episode a full 75, life. Episode 75, she says, I am no longer a stranger to Collinwood, I, you know, and uh, so it only took 75 episodes for her to say that, but, uh, mm. but, you know, but yeah. Which is basically two days. <laughs> <laughs> two days in real time. <laughs> I do know that, um, I know that we have to worry about climate change nowadays, but I'm sure there's something climate change going on at Collinsworth because it, the storms are nonstop in that place. <laughs> storms and fog. Yeah, there's storms, essentially. It's like... It's like, but I have to say, I love the way when they have a storm and they happen to be at the Blue Riot Whale drinking, and I love the way they have the windows. It looks like there's like sheets of rain coming down. I quite like that. I like it's quite nice. And they still have their only three or four track jukebox. Yeah. <laughs> Same music over and over and over. Well, apparently the Blue Whale now serves food. <laughs> <Yeah. figure. laughs> And the same bartender, now his name is Andy. Remember, he started out as Joe, then he turned into Bob, then he turned into some name. That Does anybody ever pay the bartender? They just drink. <laughs> that's why he looks drink. so miserable. He looks so miserable when he's serving these people. And that's why. I don't think he gets tips. <laughs> <laughs> they must have a hell of a tab. We all know Sam probably got one. Well, I know the Blue Rail must have had some difficulty with business because they had to get tablecloths. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, I have to say that Joan Bennett um, or Elizabeth's daughter didn't have a lot to do. She spent a lot of time comforting people. Yeah. And she opens the doors. To... She opens the doors. She gives Victoria yeah. tranquilizers on occasion. <laughs> <laughs> and a spoon. She, she Here, take these and a spoon. Like, I'll tell you, I usually just throw Advil at people across the room. I have. But I'll tell you, in episode, this is episode 84, when she gets, when, when, Vicky is finally released from the room. This is, I think, the first time that you start to see a switch from what was originally a strong take charge character who stood up to people, but this but this experience with the room scared her so much that I think now you're starting to see some weakness to her. She's starting to get a little softer. And I think this is a gradual transition over into what the character of Vicky becomes. I don't think they intended it to happen that way, but it's very interesting that after, and it would scare anybody, I think. It would be a traumatic experience to be locked in and then see the guy with the, with the seaweed dripping and then, you know, and then, and, and then come out of there and she's, she's ready to leave and she leaves it to David and David says, oh, I don't want you to leave because you saw a ghost. I do, I, I've seen ghosts. Now I love you. You've seen ghosts. Crazy. But it is, I think, the beginning of a transition for her. I did like the scene where Victoria tells Carolyn off. Finally. That was very well done. I was like, it's about time that someone made Carolyn see the evils of her way. This is, um, part, of go- this is part of Vicky's strength. Uh, and they originally wrote her, I think, because she was the main emphasis, the main character of the show. So this is somebody, and, and, he, and if you figure, here she was brought up in a foundling home. And, uh, and having to deal with all these issues and who are her parents and stuff like that. But she's developed an inner resilience to her. And I think that kind of fit with the early Vicky at the show. Mm. Yeah, it's good, it's good to see that. And I think it's, you know, it was wise to actually put that in there, that she's, she's the voice of reason, which is quite good. She calls, and I quite like that they had Victoria calling people out. You know, when they're, when they're giving bullshit out, Victoria's always calling them out, which is quite yep. good. Though that pen, I know, I know the pen is setting things up, and as we as we get to the end of episode ninety one, we'll see where uh, when we get to the next lot, the pen's going to actually mean more, which we'll get to uh, next next episode. Was this the month. episodes where uh, uh, Louis Edmond takes her out in the town? No. He takes her out in the town, but he takes her to Blue Whale. He's going to go. Let's go out for a night in the town. Goes to Blue Whale. Beside, he sees Sam and um, Joe and Maggie. Having a nice fun time, okay, taking the right. piss out of Collins's, and then he calls Sam over, which kind of ruins the party. And then he goes home and tattles on Joe to Carolyn, doesn't he? Yeah, he was with so, Maggie. Yeah, yeah, and um, which is basically like the start of the downfall of the, the relationship between Joe and Carolyn because of Roger and his thing for his niece. Which and then Carolyn magically <laughs> realizes that she loves him. All of a sudden, she loves Joe, and she but she only loves she only loves Joe. If there's no one else around, it's kind of yeah. weird. It's like, you know, if, if somebody, had, she says, oh, I love you, I love you, right, to Joe, only when Burke um, doesn't pay enough attention to her. Right. It's so okay for wanted- her to stand Joe up, but it's not okay when Joe decides he has another dinner date. And he was really trying to be nice about it. You know, he, he was trying back to- in the day when everybody gets all gussied up to go have a dinner date, too. You know, mm-hmm. I went and had lunch with Nez yesterday. We just had sweat. So no one gets gussy enough to go eat anymore. <laughs> that's because that's how that's the class system that you're born into, Vicky. I know. <laughs> you're never, you're, that's you're never true. gonna break away from it. <laughs> I was born from that northern New York trash that I'm yeah. so proud of. <laughs> I'm from poor white trash, and I'm very happy with it. <laughs> <laughs> I love my poor white trailer trash roots <laughs> from upstate New York. Yeah. <laughs> so. um but yeah, I mean, I mean, these are a, it's interesting series of um, uh, episodes. I mean, not a lot really happens. There's a lot of going over things over and over and over over. It's almost like 
just in case you've missed a couple episodes, we're going to go over this again, but in a slightly different way. And that's what it felt like. So, but saying that, I was interested. I didn't fall asleep or my brain didn't want to. No, I actually was getting into these episodes. It's starting to, it's starting to get me more vested in it. Like I said, I don't remember these ones. I was far too young. And it finally, you know, in the, just the last five, six years, these, these things have started coming out where you could watch them all again. Because a lot of us were younger when, when these first, you know, came out. And so it is like a soap opera to me now. And I will just like, oh, yeah, can we see what's going to happen, you know? There's also yeah. a nice scene where uh, Liz is, uh, starts to talk to Carolyn about her relationship with Paul Stoddard and about how when she met him and she fell in love with him. And this is really a real exposition into the things that uh, everybody's going to see later on. Because that, because that thing with, her and uh, and Paul Stoddard are going to be is going to be the focus. Uh, and again, we don't want to let anything let any cats out of the bag. But that's going to be the focus of something really major uh, in a little while. Uh, but but it's it, it's kind of weird because you would think that up to now uh, Liz told her uh, about him, but it's almost like Carolyn is hearing this for the first time. And I guess that's for us. Uh, it doesn't seem very realistic, but it really does talk about how uh, when she met him and she loved him and, and he turned on her. And, uh, so it's the beginning. Yeah, I guess also, though, we also find out that um, Elizabeth Stoddard's one true love was Nick Calder. Was it Calder? Nick Calder? Ned Calder. Ned Calder. Ned. So we yeah. find out, and we found out in these episodes that was oh, her yeah, first that's true right. love. Yeah, we did. So, yeah. and then, but there was Paul Stoddard that carried her away. So oh, that was, yeah, go ahead. I'm that sorry. was quite interesting. So we found out a little about that, which, of course, you know, in a couple episodes, a couple of months back, she wanted him to come back to take over the plant, didn't she? Yeah. And he refused. Mm-hmm. So, so it's a nice little nod to that. So that's what's quite interesting about these series of episodes that when you start watching from the beginning, there's all these little nods that go back to things that just seem like they're just off the cuff remarks, but actually you come back again. So someone's like, yeah, you know, it's like, I, and you think to yourself, like once you carry on, it's like, thank God I was paying attention because that would have bypassed me when, you know, the whole situation. So that was quite interesting. Right. And we, and we also, for the first time now, hear of the Frank Garner and Richard Garner, the lawyers or the Collins yep. family. And uh, we see that this is <laughs> Vicky using the paper to try and see if she can get the key from the door, uh, you know, out of the door with the room and uh, picks up the picks up. And there just happens to be uh, some billing invoice uh, by the Garners and the name of Betty Hanscom is there. And we know Betty Hanscom. Uh, and once again, that was from Vicky's summary. We know Betty Hanscom as that, portrait that Vicky found in uh, the Evans house that reminded her uh, that looked just like her. And so Vicky is trying to see if there's any kind of a maternal relationship that is, is Betty Hanscom, the mother. And now she sees that there was some kind of an involvement with uh, the law firm. So that's put out there. I think another thing that's quite interesting that they mentioned slightly is that the, the person that um, Burke and um, Roger uh, hit, along with the wife, um, Laura, was last name Hanscom as well. So yeah, they, exactly. and they did mention it, and they brought it up, but they haven't really, they haven't done any connections yet. So it's got, there's something quite interesting, because that would have been 10 years, well, that would have been 10 years ago from when the show is set, and it would have been 10 years before, well, how old is Vicky? 18, 19? Let's say nine, nine to ten years before she was born. Right. So. Yeah. After She's a young she was girl. Born. I think. Her, she was Carolyn, born, they're so. supposed to be just out of their teens or just the very. I think she's twenty. Yeah. She's, 20. she's like yeah. nineteen, twenty. Yeah. Carolyn's eighteen, eighteen to twenty. Mm-hmm. Though I would sit there and say she's got to be past eighteen, because, or she never went to school. I'm not quite sure because. You know, we don't, it doesn't sound like she went to school because she doesn't seem like she just got out of school recently when the show starts. She sounds like Vicky. No, um, Carolyn. Carolyn. Oh, Carolyn. So she, yeah. so she's yeah. probably not. Maybe Carolyn's nineteen. Maybe not we quite. Don't even know. They never talked about her school. Uh, yeah. Never. Although I believe in the writer's guide, and I 
not going to, I'm not going to hold myself to it, but I think it mentioned that she went to the public school system in Collinsport. We know she didn't have any friends. (laughs) Because no one comes and visits her. (laughs) Seriously, because people, they're like the prince of darkness. They don't have any friends. I mean, nobody honestly comes up there unless it's the police because they're murdered or Joe's, you know. (laughs) trying to check out and see what Carolyn's up to, or you got Burke, you know, coming in and, and screaming, he's going to take over the joint, but they don't have a social life and, and they don't really go into why Mrs. Stoddard really, you, you can surmise why she's a, a recluse, Yeah, but they don't really well, go into it yet. We know there's something to do with her, her, her husband leaving her. Right. And then you got Roger. No, I mean, Roger's not exactly the, toast to the town he kind of like just sticks himself because he thinks he's better than everyone else and then you got carolyn who basically it's like it's quite funny like here they go you know collinsport let's sit there and say it's probably got about maybe two thousand people living in collinsport i guess we can guess because it's like it's a really small town isn't it roger's fun roger's fun to watch though and uh one of the and it wasn't a great line for the writers but roger was saying when i'm satisfied if you're satisfied liz and if david's satisfied then i'm satisfied too and if dickie's satisfied so everybody's satisfied uh not one of his better efforts but uh he's good but it's, it's, it's an odd town because you think that like if you're in a small town like i'm from sackets harbor which is which is was a uh, boating town or stuff like this it's on the coast of right. uh, upstate New York. And when you went into the pub, everyone goes, hello, Keith. Here, everyone's like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> no one knows anyone. <laughs> you think it'd be like, cheers, you know? It's like, Joe walks in, hello, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> hello, everyone. <laughs> but it's just like. Every time I go to Second Harbor now, I don't recognize anybody when I go home. So. Yeah, but I'm saying if you lived in that small town and right. you lived there every day of your life. I mean, we left and came back, so you didn't have that. But I remember when I was living there with, in the, the town that size. Oh, yeah. You know, everyone so knew much... who you were. If I sneeze yeah. on, the, on the street corner, I walk into the store two blocks away, and they said, God bless you from when you sneeze two blocks away. You well, know, it's kind of like everyone... Brooklyn. In Brooklyn, when I was growing up, and that was a totally different uh, era and era, and people, everybody knew each other, and people would sit out at night on the stoops and uh, talk to each other and the old the old the old jewish ladies in my building that lived out on the uh the, the, <laughs> they got out there in their chairs and, and you know they sat out and you talked to them and everybody knew each other even though it was new york city brooklyn and brooklyn were composed of small neighborhoods and, yeah. uh, and it was uh it was just a very, very homey feeling. And you didn't have to Small worry town about. in a big town. Small but town in a big There was, city, I think not. we're just probably the last generation that really is ever going to know that. But you do I find, think. but in Collinsport, it's, Collinsport is kind of weird. Because you just think, I mean, I know, I, may, I think some maybe they, there's sometimes I think they missed a trick because I know they would have to pay the extra just to say hello. So maybe that's the reason why they didn't. But it'd be nice if maybe they just gave it, you know, when any of them walked in, you know, they just got a nod from the bartender. <laughs> something. <laughs> or something. I I'm like, those every time they walk in, they, everyone looks at them like they're strangers. Like, who are these strange people? Well, they don't <laughs> pay this bartender. Okay. Like Sam, Sam's like, he just like looks at it. You know, points to his glass and just like he just hits it and walks off. He's probably know, got a huge let's, tab. Let's talk about Sam's bar tab. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> well, New York isn't doing too bad either. Let me tell you. Uh, yeah, no. and, uh, but I do love the outside scenery. You know, once again, all that was in Essex, Connecticut. And yeah. uh, with the Collins Port Inn and the sheriff's office and so forth, and you see the characters walking around. And that is something you do not see in the later episodes because they gave that okay. up. Uh, so it's it, it, it's really a treat. It, it, it always adds some perspective uh, that we, you will not see later. Right. I had to there say one thing that makes me smile about these episodes and because when we get into the barn of this year's, which is basically the ones that they kind of made when the reruns would come on, this is the one that they would start with they the start with. Year. So, And so they would go on from there. So obviously they lost a lot of the beginnings and the fronts of these episodes that we right. have here. So anything before that time period, what we get is the clapper boards. And then we also get the ads um, for afterwards. And they go, and don't forget to watch Bewitch. I in at color. 8 o'clock on in ABC. <laughs> it's like, color. I love those in color. I <laughs> love Valley. that stuff too. Oh my God, I do. I, I, I watched the credits at the end just to hear the Orbox and, you yeah. know, Fashion by Orbox. And then that this guy. This has been a Dan Curtis production. <laughs> 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 
I love that. I love all that. And I know that when we get when we get further on, and then um, and then when the storylines start taking off in the direction that everyone knows, and that actually made Dark Shadow his name, and it's kind of sad when you start. They, they those are no longer included because, of course, they were able to you know mute all that stuff out and stuff like right. this because this is how they're going to sell it for syndication. But these early episodes, it's great to hear all that because it does give you a sense of exactly what was going on at this time, like in 1966. This is yeah. the shows that were on. This is what was going on, you know, and it gave you that kind it's of. It's so cool too. I mean, it is yeah. because I don't remember. I was not. I was born 64, so I have no clue what happened in the 60s. I was getting a clue, well, like in the 70s, I start remembering stuff. But yeah, I think my earliest memory is probably the Partridge Family and Brady Bunch. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Gilligan's there. Island. Gilligan's Island, yeah. And Bewitch was, to me, was always in syndication. It was always the reruns. I don't remember watching them in the evenings. Kill Burnett show, I remember. My I was mother watched that time. and Laugh-In and Laugh-In. My mother yep. watched Laugh-In. Yep. Yep. I was 13 and 14 when Dark Shadows was on, and it was, uh, and it was, uh, it was a hell of a time to be. And uh, I want to mention one more thing, by the way, about George uh, Matthews, who played, uh, uh, who played Amos Fitch. And it's another blooper. I don't know where the hairstylist was, but uh, when he was in Collinwood talking to Liz and Roger, and he had a good close-up of his black suit, and he's got dandruff. So this Ooh, is one of the, the joy, yeah, the guy who played uh, the guy, Amos Fitch, the guy from The Honeymooners, who uh, okay. we talked about him before. He's got dandruff. You can see dandruff on his uh, He should have used head and shoulders. Did yeah, they have head and shoulders back then? <laughs> Probably. I don't know. Yeah. Head and shoulders. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It's one of the only Dark Shadows characters that I believe had dandruff. And nothing worse than dandruff with all that huge, all that gel in your hair. <laughs> oh, grimy, <laughs> yes. Oh. It's so crazy. Yeah, dandruff with grease stains, like as it slides down. Like on the oil no. <laughs> That's so gnarly. <laughs> So, so I think what we'll do is we're going to cut back to our interview, our second part interview with Asim Faraj, and we'll be back afterwards from our sponsors. Amazon. Oops, wrong Amazon. Although we both contain an array of diversity, the rainforest with all of its animals and us with all of our products, come check us over today and find all the products you need quickly and efficiently. And buy it with one click. And now you can even use us to donate to your favorite charities using Amazon Smile. Amazon Smile is worth your while. Come check us out today. So you were talking about a director's cut for um, Night... Night of Dark Shadows. There we go. Okay. And yeah. um, is, do you know if that's available or did you ever get a chance to see that, the, the director's yeah, cut? Yeah, I, I, uh, it's not available yet. Um, we're still working on it. I know that people say that the restoration is over and the restoration is dead. It's not. Mm. Um, Darren Gross has been still fearlessly spearheading this restoration for 20 years. Literally, it'll be 20 years this this year that uh, he discovered the footage. Okay. Um, wow. And uh, he and I have been working on it for the past four or five years, mm. um, uh, making steady progress on various aspects of it. Um, it, it's, it still has a while to come. Mm -hmm. but it is not dead and um 
if everything sort of falls into place, if all the bigger picture string holders allow things to happen, mm -hmm. I don't see this. Uh, I, I and we're coming up on 50 years of this film, 1971 and 2021. Mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't say that it's over yet, but uh, it is uh, the 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 128 minute uh, director's cut extended cut maybe is a better term for it um it's leaps and bounds beyond the the truncated version um and it really shows what uh what a class act filmmaker dan curtis could have been or was he was he definitely was yeah. because winds of war and warner members and all that shows but working in a, a theatrical field in the in a you know the motion picture medium mm -hmm. um right there's there's some incredible stuff that he did and, and that it, it's in the long cut um and hopefully everybody will be able to see that soon enough oh excellent. But yeah. what was the film when they found the film footage what was the quality like was it good quality or did you have to do a little bit of work on it um well uh he's he found the um what we've been working from has been sort of the red track the red uh <laughs> interpositive uh -huh. you could call it um you know the film is separated down to uh, red uh red uh green and blue so we've been working off the red track um because you can see better detail in and in, in it um but it's a matter of the the, the film is all the, the image quality is great it's beautiful i mean obviously with now today's technology a 4k scan would be nice to do and some you know digital cleanup and and whatnot and to merge the, all the colors together because we've only been looking at it in black and white okay. um so some of the stuff i'd i'd really love to see what it looks like in color uh like the seance that would be so nice to see um and hopefully we will see that uh but obviously it was missing um, a good amount of the sound there's about I want to say 10 to 12 minutes of audio that does exist. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the rest has been re-recorded. There's still some things that need to be gotten. And obviously Grayson Hall is still a thing, but we might have some leads, but you never know. Mm -hmm. Fingers crossed, fingers crossed. It's not dead, but um, it's not coming tomorrow. Yeah. Is, is well, what I can really say. We'll but it is an amazing <laughs> film. Yeah. Definitely be waiting for that one. Make sure you yeah. everything put on Blu-ray so I can put it with my two. Oh Blu yeah, that would be that would be the, the thing. I keep telling Darren, I'm like, we've got to do like a commentary track on this once it's all done because the amount of the amount of trivia and history that um, I've learned just just going through the footage and that he and I talk about. I've been talking to Darren Gross since I was 10 years old. I emailed him out of the blue um, <laughs> when shortly after he found the footage. This tells you what a very strange kid I was. <laughs> um, and um, we've been talking ever since. And um, he's helped me out on a great deal of my, my own films. And I've been lucky enough to assist him on this, this project. And uh, so, yeah, we've, we've, we talk about Night of Dark Shadows all the time. I'm like, we got to do a commentary track, man. It's going to be so great when this, when this is finally done. <laughs> Well, and, considering uh, that most of yeah. the past, you know, for Night of Dark Shadows are still around as well, which is quite yeah. Cool. So it'd be, you know, yeah. you got you got to get them together because, I mean, when they did release the Blu-rays of House of Dark Shadows and Night of Dark Shadows, I mean, it's they're bare bones discs. And you're, yeah. You know what are you doing in there? Was yeah. So, so yeah. It it it. I know there was there was plans for other things, but then um, other bigger entities had other ideas, basically. Well, yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah, I guess. When so. the men in black step in, beware. So Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, looks like Tom is with us. Hello, Tom. How are you guys? Hello, Keith. Hello, Vicky. Hi. And, and our special Hi. guest there. Um, once again, uh, sorry, I, uh, sorry I got into this rather late, but um, it's good to see that you guys are talking 
uh, and uh, and to- and talking well. And and this may have been mentioned already, so forgive me. But uh, the other things I think that they had planned after Night of Dark Shadows, um, they had planned the third film, Curse of Dark Shadows, uh, with Denise Nickerson, but that just never came to fruition. Uh, but that's just a, a piece of trivia now uh in the in the big spectrum of things that's actually that's i darren and i have have investigated that thoroughly it was called death of dark shadows was oh what was that thank you for death of dark shadows yeah, I, yeah it was I, in I 1978 almost, yeah no we, yeah. we've we've gone into like such detail of like okay what would have been the third had there been a third um what would there have been even a direct sequel to house of dark shadows a barnabas part two film but there, there never was any plans for for either a a direct continuation of the House of Dark Shadows storyline with Barnabas, well, or just, a third Dark Shadows. Fighting. If Jonathan had taken, if Jonathan had agreed to do, and this is my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, if Jonathan had agreed to continue as Barnabas, then I think they were thinking of doing uh, the 1795 storyline in the second film it was one of two possibilities that they were thinking of but when jonathan refused to do it then that all fell apart they never developed anything further yeah it was just it was a it was a concept that they could go do a yeah a a past and present and that's what dan integrated into night of dark shadows with going back and forth Mm -hmm. between Mm -hmm. past and present um it was going to be something like that but they never it was just a oh what if we do this there was never any Sam Hall, Gordon Russell never wrote anything down. Dan never wrote right. anything down. It was just a, a casual one off concept. Right. Um, and then we went into that for the third one of would there have been, could there have been, but Dan was so burnt out, especially when MGM made him recut the film uh, that what his plans were, was to do Jekyll and Hyde again for MGM uh, with Jack Palance again right. in the role using the same scripts Mm-hmm. which would have been really cool, I think, to do that, you know, as a feature film and get into that sort of R-rated territory that he got into with House and with Night, especially the extended cut of Night. It's very R-rated in terms of sexuality. I don't um, want to see it, though. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, I would love to see it. <laughs> yeah, right. It's, it's, a, it's a good one. But um, that would have been really neat to see um, a full-on MGM and, you know, MGM had done, you know, the Spencer Tracy Jekyll and Hyde, and they owned the rights to the Paramount Frederick March Hyde. That's so right. to do a, a, a third one, a 70s one, and, and you've got Dan Curtis with his Metro Color and handheld camera work and blood spurting across the street. Oh, shit, that would be amazing. <laughs> but we didn't get that. <laughs> Dang. So, but we got Burn Off Rings. So yeah. that's cool. I love it. Yeah. Trilogy of Terror. And that and had Trilogy plenty of... And that had plenty of handheld camera work with the Zuni. <laughs> yeah. And Night Strangler. The Night Strangler. Well, I have to sit and say that um, Dan Curtis, my hat's off to him, because he dealt with a lot of difficult personalities and some of his stuff. <laughs> Karen Black wasn't easy. Oliver Reed wasn't easy. Betty Davis wasn't easy. Richard, um, Robert Mitchum wasn't easy. <laughs> That's like, he, he, was pretty, he was pretty good at, like, you know. Maneuver- but Dan was, a, Dan was a lion, so he... Mm. I think he had a knack for, for, because I don't want to say that Dan, I never, I wish I could have met Dan Curtis. This is one of my regrets. I unfortunately never got to meet him. Um, but from all that I've learned from him, learned about him, he could be his own sort of wild card. So I think he knew how to handle difficulty and he wasn't going about to take anybody's shit. He was going, we're going to do this and we're going to do it now. And right. from what I know, said. damn it, hurry up. From what yeah. I read, he was extremely passionate about his work. To the oh, yeah. Extent where, uh, and, and, and he was a my way or the highway kind of guy. But on the other hand, he was very receptive to uh, suggestions that he could see instantly, like when he dealt with Robert Colbert, uh, and uh, they were trying to figure out, well, what would be a good theme for Quentin's theme? And the story is that Dan went over to Robert Colbert and, Colbert and said, you know, I know it may take you a couple of weeks, uh, but if you could really come up with something and explain the concept, and he says, I can, I can give you one in 30 seconds. And it yeah. was Quentin's, and it was, he had used Quentin's theme in the Jack Palance, Dr. And, Jekyll and right. Mr. Hyde. In so the he, background, yeah. And, and Dan Curtis heard it, and he said, I love it. 
and he leapt right into it. So he knew how to handle difficult people. On the other hand, you had to know how to handle him. But if he agreed, yeah, with- and he also knew he also knew what would work, and he knew who would who would be the best for what he wanted to achieve. And I'm subsequently, uh, you know, through Jim Pearson, had met several actors that had worked with Dan. And they all immediately, and then you say Dan Curtis, they're all immediately like, oh my God, I would do anything for Dan. Uh, he was a fantastic, uh, you know, filmmaker uh, presence behind the camera. So he, he could be hard, hard nosed about what he wanted, uh, you know, but you, you kind of have to be, I, I know I can be hard nosed when I want a specific thing and, you know, time is against you, but um, he, his crew and his actors loved him for for who he was and for for they saw they they knew he knew what to do and and how to do it and how to get things done and they respected that so i think you you have that kind of leeway as well of well and i think be, that, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah and I think the famous story, uh, and you know, I'm thinking of Barbara Steele when they did the remake, uh, the Ben Cross uh, remake of Dark Shadows, and 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 you know, I mean, she was in more and remembers with him and and everything, right? And produced but, those for him exactly. But when it came to uh, her taking, she was so she was so upset at you know at what he was doing. I mean, she actually walked off this. She actually. I think either walked off the set or threatened to walk off the set. I think she walked off the set, but then she came back the next day. Yeah. But, uh, but everybody was so – she gave Curtis hell, and the, the entire crew clapped when she walked off yeah. because they had always they, – they just felt so uh, – they felt, they felt so frustrated. They, right. You know, trying to get the best – They empathized. But they empathized, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, but then she still had the well, so. the, the respect to come back. She yeah. still had the respect yeah, and yeah. to come back and and I think that probably that's something that Dan might have respected in his own way. I I I can't. I'm speaking from my own you know gathered opinion of of this man that I never met. But that feels to me like something that you know she went she she gave him the business, but then she came back and and right. he could respect that she had her own mind about things. Yeah. You know. I mean, definitely um, respected her. Definitely so respected she's, her. Yeah. she's always professional. I think he respected yeah. the professional. If yeah, yeah, gonna, yeah. You know, if you're going to play childish games, he has no time for it. But if you're going to be professional, he'll respect right. that. Which, right, right, exactly. And in, Holly, looked- in Hollywood, there's a lot of immaturity. And so, yep. when yep. You, you know, you need the professional. And that's what he was yeah. So I, but I, I was impressed, actually, but he was so passionate about his work. And I remember reading when he was doing the golf classic, uh, the CBS golf classics, which he handled for a lot of years. And uh, at one point, they were not happy with what he with what he did. And he actually came to his secretary. And this may be documented, I think, in the uh, new DVD, uh, Master of Dark Shadows. Where he actually came to the secretary. He started he was in tears. He was in absolute tears uh, over, you know, not being able yeah. uh, to, to have, you know, so, and that's how, that's how devoted he was to his work. Yeah, he, yeah exactly. He was married to his, his job. Mm. Um, yeah, but also I, with, with this business and with having to get things done, get think, you know, it takes an army and Dan was one of the best generals. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and you have to be that, you have to have that temperament and that, um, drive and that passion to get things accomplished, to get things rolling in this in this industry. So it takes a certain kind of man, and Dan was that kind of man. Uh, yeah. Okay. Actually, I'm going to put you on the spot right now, and I'm going to okay. ask you, which do you prefer, Night of Dark Shadows or House of Dark Shadows? Which one is your favorite? And you have to pick one, or we're yeah. going to have to come and kill your pets. <laughs> <laughs> I okay no I can answer this I can answer this um night night of dark shadows um I and I can answer that because that's the one that I watched endlessly um on videotape because I was obsessed with the photography mm-hmm. and the way that Lindhurst looked and the feeling that even in that in that uh, in the truncated form Dan was still able to achieve a mood and an atmosphere and convey all that. Um, and I just wanted to like fall into that. And so I was just watch that tape over and over and over and also try to like in my head piece together where scenes had been cut and how would the film play out 
with these scenes reinstalled and and then subsequently I've been able to do that of like <laughs> putting the film together and looking at it and seeing the, the full thing but the and it's still the, the mood the atmosphere the photography all that is still there it's even mm -hmm. more so but um I, house is house is great fun house is like the perfect halloween movie you know in october of like it's kind of cold and it's kind of wet outside and the wind is blowing and then it's doing the same thing in the movie and you've got you know all those rich colors and and you've got all the actors and it's over in 95 minutes and but night i is more lyrical and more i find Dan is, I... is really trying to be con taken as a serious filmmaker and and he's doing just a gothic romance which is something he always wanted to do but he's just doing it under the guise of the dark shadows franchise because he knows i got this film greenlit under the dark shadows label but i'm going to do what i want regardless if it's connected to the show or not i've got my my players who i know are reliable and we're going to just do this mm -hmm. and do it you know seriously do it professionally and 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 you know try to try to jump um and then mgm pissed all over it unfortunately yeah. excuse I, my language I, 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 well don't <laughs> worry I mean, we've said a lot worse than that okay. um, yeah <laughs> i have to agree with you about a night of dark shadows it's like for some reason that film still haunts me years after years and there's certain scenes in that that still haunt me like the woman on the swing and different things that mm -hmm. really that still haunt me and plus kate jackson <laughs> I, I think if they ever if they ever <laughs> well, of course, I think if they ever uh, get the unedited version, I think it would really be a treat to watch because um, I, I, you could, I could tell when I first saw it uh, that there were things that I just felt were missing from that film. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, big you, time. Yeah, yeah. The character development, the way that, the way. So uh, maybe I can say this. I probably shouldn't, but I'll say it anyway. Um, in, in working on the this restoration, we've been talking with Bob Cobert and the spotting of the music, and the um, the evolution of Quentin's theme on the piano, and how later on Dan plays it until you know it comes into its full evolution as David is walking down the hallway. You know, in the last act of the film, he is now possessed by Charles Collins. He is Charles Collins. But in the long cut of the way that Dan trickles that out and slowly builds it, immediately from, the, from, the, from him stepping into the house, something is off. And he really builds it and twists it and twists it and uses the music. And um, there's this, the famous cut scene of Lara at the piano playing the theme and, and David, you know, running there in the past. and when you see that in the film and in the, the full storyline of the film, like, it's just like, shit, he was such a master storyteller and really how he was setting the audience up and slowly building this, this, the, the, the haunting has begun from the first second of the film. We just were unaware of it. Um, I, it, yeah, I, I, hopefully that also made sense too, but sorry, I got very passionate. <laughs> Oh, don't worry about that. Do we know why MGM cut it? Was it because of time restraints? They wanted to show more showings, or was it had a, a number of reasons? Primarily, we can start with James Aubrey, who was uh, the head of MGM and was not a very nice guy by all accounts. And this was not the only film that he inflicted the scissors upon. Um, uh, he, David Lean's Ryan's daughter. Um, Sam Peckinpah's uh, uh, Pat Garrett and the Billy the Kid, um, several films, um, and um, he just looked at this as drive-in fare, that and is this is a quick buck. I don't give a damn. Just th this is this is, and also, but you know, at the same time, in the studio system's defense, having seen the long cut of the film. They are expecting, especially House of Dark Shadows, is so slam bang quick, yeah. and um, it's a, it's a visceral horror film. It is it's not hiding what it intends to be. Barnabas is a blood sucking monster, and you know, come see how the vampires do it. That's the tagline. Yeah. The Night of Dark Shadows, in the long form and Dan's intended form, it's a, it's a gothic romance. It's a it's more crim. It, it, if you've seen Guillermo del Toro's Crimson peak it's more along the lines of that it's 
just a slow burn, you know, love story, love triangle between Quentin, uh, Kate Jackson and Laura. Uh, and so as a studio, okay, we're expecting this is going to be a follow up haunted house horror movie that, you know, we that made this first violent vampire film. This is going to be another one of those. And you sit down and you watch two and a half hours or two hours and 20, two hours and eight minutes of a slow burn. And now they're on a picnic. And now they're sort of looking at each other lovingly. And now he's going back to the tower. And now he's having another dream. And now he's thinking of another woman. And and then, and then, and so I, I understand where they kind of overreacted, mm-hmm. but I also understand what Dan wanted to do. And the, and this happens all the time in Hollywood of, oh, yeah, of course, you know, what, what is the film that, that the, the people that are paying for, have intended and what is the filmmaker artist trying to achieve and how do you either compromise or how do you fight over that product? Um, and that's what happened. Um, well, I also, I guess yeah. it's because the studio system at that time studios was broken, like, was breaking down. They didn't know where they were going. Yeah. Films that shouldn't be making money were making money like easy ride. Right. Beyond the Valley right. of Dolls, even though yes. Fox is horrified by it. But, um, but you know, these things yeah, yeah, are yeah. bringing people in. And, and the old Hollywood's like, well, we don't know what to do or how to do it. Right. Is it, is it, is it, is it true old also, school against the, against the new school sort of thing? Is, and of course, is, the new school is, wins. Is it true also that House of Dark Shadows saved them from bankruptcy? I, rem- I remember. It's that. not entirely true, but it's not entirely false either. It's not it's not the end all claim that that film completely like saved them. That's the popular myth. Darren and I have gone in and researched this one as well, Mm -hmm. but it, it made them a very, very nice sum and way more than they were ever anticipating. Um, And it helped keep them in the, in the clear that year. But But it also um, gave them a lot of privacy as well at the same time that they had the fight. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately. yeah, yeah, and that parents were sort of upset when they went to the drive-in and saw, <laughs> you know, what what this was. Mm. But I don't think that they really bothered were bothered by that because look at look at the films that were coming out at that time as well. I you you had performance that had just been released from Warner Brothers, so that's pretty controversial. Yeah. Um, it, and did you, you know, know we weren't I, in, no? Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Oh no! I was just gonna get very film history trivia geek on you, and I'll spare you guys that. <laughs> no, you can get that. No, I mean, no, no, Rosemary, you, you can do that. Baby. Well, we had Rosemary's Baby coming out at the same time. Had- yeah, it was in '68, yeah, and 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 Sam Peck with with the Wild Bunch in '69. Mm-hmm. You know, it. Oh, that was an R-rated film, but and Robert I don't Evans think was that, about to come out and do his thing, and yeah, so yeah, did a lot of interesting. Sh- no, interesting things what I was going to say though about House, and this is kind of an aside, but even though you know Jonathan had to play uh, the more uh, traditional vampire in that film, every once in a while he kind of sneaks things in, and I, and Dan Curtis let it through, where he'll be you'll, you'll see the guilt over his face, where he'll turn his head away from the camera. You know, uh, when, they're, yeah. when they're talking and, and they do, when, you know, he's thinking about what, what he's become. The torment is still there. Yeah. It's still there. And he manages to get it in. And, yeah, and, and I, I think also in, the, in some of those scenes that got cut from House of Dark Shadows, it's, it's even more apparent. Mm-hmm. And it was more ingrained in the character. It's just then Dan cut those. Yeah. Um, but I don't think that it was ever lost on Dan, nor was it ever, did Jonathan ever intend to not get those those colors of the character into the portrayal he you know he recognized that it was a different barnabas but i'm still going to put these traits in there just to you know so yeah but but yeah it would be interesting to see a longer cut of house where you get to see more of that torment did they ever and and excuse me for asking this question if it's it's already but did they but did they have plans ever to do an unedited house if 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 those Cutscenes There's been started. searches for footage, but nothing exists at all. I I know that Darren has looked everywhere, far and wide, um, but there's nothing. It doesn't exist. Screenplay the out film there, that no was released, really, there's 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 nothing. There's just the script that we have and some photographs. Um, there's no David hide, hanging in the closet in right. someone's clo- you know vault. That doesn't 
or the, the police going and opening Carolyn's coffin and seeing that she's not in there, which is now why they all got crucifixes. All that, that logic is right. Right. You know, makes sense. Um, all that. I, I know that he's looked and he's looked and it, it doesn't exist, but the film that, that was released is Dan's intended cut. It's the film that he wanted to, that he approved of. It wasn't a case of night where it was, you know, well, you know, interestingly, I remember when I saw it in the theater, there was something uh, when Carolyn's biting Todd for the first time. It was, uh, and I never forgot it because he did it so expertly. You see, in the in the theatrical version, she's pulling away from his neck, and my guess is is, and you can talk to me about the technical aspects of this. Uh, and uh, uh, they actually, it looked like she was actually drinking blood from his neck as she pulled away. And my guess was it was a food capsule and then they did it and then they filmed it in reverse so that it looked like uh, she was actually, and that was not in the syndicated versions. I haven't seen it in syndicated and I haven't seen it in the TV version. They expertly cut that out. Um, do you know what I'm talking yeah. about? I do know what you're talking about because that's a really nice shot. I know exactly that shot. Um, no, it's in the it's in the uh, it's in the Blu-ray. It's on the it's on the videotape. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that that's a reversed shot because then we would be able to tell that the blood is going back up mm -hmm. um, instead of going down. I think what it was is they had a, a, um, a okay um, when when John Carlin is staked. Or when, when the arrow hits John Carlin in the back and he falls, you can see that there's this cable that's going up his, his jacket and down his leg and stuff. And you can even see at some point it turns red because it's a, it's a tube that they've got the, the blood ready to pump in through mm. his back. So right. I think what they had is a, a tube much like that hidden up Nancy's dress, you know, and she's in profile in that shot. Uh, right. So it's on the other side of, from camera. And it's tubed in right by her mouth. Another good example would be if you look carefully in The Exorcist when Linda Blair is spewing out the vomit, mm -hmm. you can see that there's like two little tubes on the corners of her mouth, which right. is where it's coming out of. So something like that was probably attached right there. And as she kind of leaned back a little bit to make it, you know, really like flow out and then leans back in to, to drink again. I know that's a really nice, nice shot in the movie. <laughs> and I um, never forgot it. And I never, yeah, it's a good one. and in the Blu-ray, you really hear the of her, her f teeth biting into his flesh. And I never <laughs> noticed that until I heard it on the Blu-ray. I'm like, Oh, nice. Very good. Is that also, you said, is that also in, uh, uh, on the DVD? Uh, yeah, it's, it was on the videotape. It was on the laser disc. It's DVD. on the, the DVD okay. and Blu-ray. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Now I yeah. gotta get the DVD. <laughs> They're out of print now. The Blu-ray and DVD oh. from Warner's are out of print of both films. Oh boy! Yeah. So you look on eBay. Yeah. Uh, or yeah, or find a cheap seller on Amazon. Yeah, you can find a cheap seller for Amazon on those. So yeah. For, for, uh, and, and what did you just? Oh, you mean it was on VHS or something like that? Is that what you mean by video? Tape? It was on VHS, but it was a pan and scan version, which is yeah. It's hard to believe. Well, that actually, it's scan. not. It's not. It's and not. It was the it. open mat. It was the open oh, matte no. print. So the film was shot in full full frame Academy ratio, 1.37 to 1, mm -hmm. and would be matted into widescreen for theatrical presentation. Oh, but okay. the, the VHS and the Laserdisc was the original camera negative. So we were seeing more picture information at the top and bottom, which is actually why there's a shot when Joan Bennett goes in to say to Lisa Richards, um, you can go home now. You see the boom moving back and forth between the two of them if you watch the Laserdisc and the videotape. Um, okay. But on the DVD and Blu-ray, it's been cropped out because it's wow. at the proper, it's at what Dan and Arthur Ornitz intended, the 1.85 aspect ratio. But so if you have your VHSs and your Laserdiscs you're, of both films, you're actually getting more, you, you, you have a, a slightly different cut of the film that, that shows more information than, that's then, interesting because uh, I always assumed yeah. that the videotape would just be pan and scan because most videotapes were. Right, that's what I thought too. But then I found that it was no, it's the full open mat. Oh, that's interesting. Um, thank you, Darren, <laughs> for for informing me. 
Thank you, Ansel, for giving us some information. Right, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I know. Yeah. No kidding. It's like now it's like, oh, where's my videotape? <laughs> what did I do with my video? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I think I got rid of all my videotapes, unfortunately. Upgraded everything to Blu-ray now. Were but, there any were there any other scenes, Ansel, on the uh, DVD version that cropped up, or was that the only one uh, that uh, off the top of your head? I know it's a it's a heck where of a you can really see like some 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 stuff happening. Scenes filmmaking. Right. Um, there's another shot that um, I also love. Uh, right after Todd has, been, God, I'm such a geek. I'm sorry. <laughs> I like seeing the film play out in my head as I'm describing. Oh, no. Todd is lying in the hospital bed, and he goes, "Carolyn," and yes. then it cuts, and it's this tracking shot to in the basement of the old house, and Barnabas comes down, and Carolyn gets out of her coffin and stuff. On the VHS, you can see the camera track, like the track that they laid down to put the camera on the dolly to move in to create wow, that shot. Wow. wow. Um, and um, I'm trying to think if in Night of Dark Shadows, if you see any anything, um, I can't remember. I don't think so. But um, but I, I there's some there's some fantastic shots in House of Dark Shadows I love. I think right after that scene, there's another shot I love, another tracking shot. And I always have tried to replicate this tracking shot that Dan does. Um, we're moving through the foyer of Collinwood, and you're, uh, Barnabas has his back to camera, and he goes into the, the sort of organ room when the police are, like, walking around, and uh, they're out trying to find Carolyn. And it's the scene when Julia looks in her makeup uh, compact and sees that he's got no reflection in the in the mirror, but he introduces the scene with the camera just following Barnabas through the foyer, and a cop walks past us, and we keep going, and we move into the music room, and it's one continuous tracking shot, and he widens, and everybody moves to their marks, and it's a very simple thing that I've always like loved that shot, and it's it's I tried to do that of like moving through doorways and widening to reveal um. Yeah, I'm just geeking here for a second. So well, no, tra- tracking shots, tracking shots when you get them right can make it. <laughs> right. I mean, he could, uh, he could as, as John more. Carpenter, if you didn't have the tracking shot in the beginning of Halloween, it wouldn't be the right. same film. Right, right, um, exactly. I mean, Kyle, even even Friday the Thirteenth tried that um, tracking shot in the third one. I think it was. <laughs> yeah. In 3D. The 3D one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. So. Um, talking back, going back to your career and stuff like this. Now you're an independent filmmaker. Okay. Um, how does? Yes. How difficult is that now to be an independent filmmaker? And I know independent filmmakers in the '60s and '70s and '80s. It was kind of like the heyday, but nowadays there seems to be less a, independent filmmakers. Yeah, that, you that 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 was a different meaning to the term of independent filmmaking back then mm-hmm. than what it is now. Um, it's it's very difficult. It's very difficult. Very frustrating. Um, but when it all works and you're there, it's the greatest feeling in the world. Um, it's, it's, um, I mean, I've been very fortunate to have very, you know, my, my family is very supportive. I don't have money. I'll tell you, I've no connections to the industry. I don't come from money. I don't have money. Mm -hmm. Um, my stuff had always been like, take a cardboard box and paint it and turn it into the inspector's office in Dr. Mabuse. And like, literally that's how I did it. It's shoestring and cardboard and bubble gum and any single magic trick I was able to learn from watching other filmmakers and how they did their, their stuff. As I mentioned, Roger Corman um, earlier. Um, And in today's age where everybody has a camera, everybody has access to editing software, everybody, believes they can go make a movie mm-hmm. um and everybody i you know that's i i don't want to sound the wrong way i don't want to sound not encouraging to some other aspiring filmmaker out there as i was at a time of you know say go out and just do it because yeah. you have all the tools to, to do it now mm-hmm. there's no excuse but having said that there are and there's so many platforms now especially yeah. to, for content and we're overwhelmed we're drowning in content the earth is going to explode because global warming doesn't exist. But before then it's going to explode because we've got so much content. And right. um, we have, as a result, all these people trying and all these people doing it. 
and all these people digging up money to go do it. Mm-hmm. So that's been the, the magic trick that I've been trying to solve right now of getting, because I've, I've been able to assemble a team over the past 10 years of good, reliable people, both in front of and behind the camera, um, people that I can trust. But, and we've done all that we can with the cardboard chewing gum and shoestring. We've gone as far as we can. And now it takes more resources. Mm -hmm. And the trick is finding those resources. And those resources exist because I see plenty of people making things that are not good by any means. And yet they've got way more than I've had on a film. So I know that that resource is out there. It's a matter of finding it. And that's the trick now. And hopefully with my upcoming film, Loon Lake, um, I can use that to, as my magic bounce house to find more resources to go make another film. I have no doubt that we'll be hearing great things from you in the future. That's Thank for you. sure. Definitely going to keep much. my eye out on your career. Thank Ansel, you. As, I'm just curious, did you have any formal training uh, through UCLA or USC or any of those schools? I, I wish. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't want to. No, I'm fully self-taught. That's I've been incredible. doing this since I was six. That's incredible. Um, I really wanted to go to Cal Arts because Tim Burton went there. This was before the Dark Shadows movie, by the way. Um, and <laughs> right. I uh, was turned down because they were like, you just, you're, you're already, we can't really teach you. You're already just doing it. Um, this wouldn't work for you. Wow. So I was, after that, I was like, all right, well, if I'm already doing it, I'm just going to keep doing it. And well, don't, don't feel so bad. I they just have. I, oh, yeah, no, feel, I don't. I no, don't. Because they, because they said Einstein was a poor math student, so it just goes. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, but I've yeah. never been one for school. I hated school. Mm-hmm. So the idea of, okay, go to school or go make a movie and go learn making a movie, I'm going to go do that. So that's why my IMDb is incredibly long until we come to 2013 <laughs> and then um, because that was all learning and teaching myself and teaching myself. I started with action. I started with my universal monster action figures and my Legos and then my friends from school yeah. and then more friends from school. And then all of a sudden I got the cast of dark shadows. So it just was a very strange evolution, but it was a nonstop process. I never stopped and I'm not going to stop. Uh, well, the other day, I mean, my friend I mean, Nate was talking about, Thank you. My friend Nate was talking about retirement. I'm like, what the hell, dude? We're we're still <laughs> almost just there, and we spent all this time just trying to get there. You want to like give it up? Oh hell, they'll they'll. I'm gonna drop dead on a soundstage, and they'll cart me off from you know from Paramount. Hopefully not Paramount. Maybe Paramount. I don't know, <laughs> but you know somewhere. <laughs> and um, I, I this is all that I can do. This is all I know how to do. Good. Once yeah. again. I mean, you, have, you have to sit there and say, though, I mean, you're coming out with, you know, four shorts or feature length films, you know, every year. I mean, that's a lot of output. I mean, you're doing more output exactly. than most television directors are at the moment. So exactly. You know, you it's on the extremely back impressive. But yeah. I learned I learned even that I can't do that now. I can't mm-hmm. if I really like Loon Lake um, that film we started working on it in november of 2017 it's now may 2019 uh we just completed it it's not we it's not screened yet we're still working on distribution but that took a year and several months and that was just one film and i realized i have to i cannot spread myself across on five different projects as i used to if i really want the quality that i need Mm-hmm. Um, and and really need to be a perfectionist about it. It has to be one project, one focus at the time. So those days of multitasking or because just making one film, as I learned on this one, making one film is an, an entire enterprise, especially at this level that we we did it. I mean, it was a full on location film. Um, we had extras, we had crew, we had period insurance. order like there was a <laughs> bunch of stuff insurance was oh my insurance. god that was like insurance. two different kinds of insurance mind you two different kinds of insurance you know about insurance 
We've had that. Yeah. Fun with so our like, girl. there's all that. That. So yeah. So you guys know what I'm talking about. It's yeah. not. Like, hey, yeah. we're gonna go out and just run around in the cornfield with the camera. Mm. Like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> no. So it's. I'm. I. I I, I, miss, I do miss, like, I'm going crazy right now. I want to go out and I want to film something. Mm-hmm. But I know if I want it to be good and I want it to be to be something I'm proud of, I have to really sit down and take my time and dedicate time to it. Otherwise, it's, what's the, you know, what am I getting out of it other than just fulfilling, you know, yeah. getting a little creative drive. I can write if I need to really do that. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, I gave you guys a really long-winded answer for not at all not at all as i was as i was was saying i feel your pain i mean we vicky and i did a film based on a script that i wrote and an award-winning script i might say yeah it's one it's one of you (laughs) but um but i mean and um basically it was a two-day shoot and it took mm. eight months. Three, <laughs> four, five thousand yeah. years. And, it and was then, just a and, nightmare. And our, and, and our insurance costs, I think, upwards to about a thousand pounds for just two days. So I yes, uh, it did. And wow. then we had to cover, they wanted us the liability for for every that every yep uh, that, that I found. Every single yeah. Everything. You know, they nickeled and dimed you. You needed this for that, and then you had rented camera equipment, which wasn't cheap. So you had to make sure you were you able to. To ensure the camera. I mean, it was. Oh my yeah. God! Oh yeah! Oh Red, yeah! All that. Colorization. All that. You know, oh yeah! So we just finished that. <laughs> That's fun. Oh, yeah. Um, sound design, sound the whole, yeah. the whole. I mean, it was not all my past work has been. And that's why I said with Will and Liz, it was myself, my buddy Nate, and my our, our friend Christine. And it was me behind the camera doing the lighting. Well, it was all natural light, natural light um, in Venice. Uh, but I wish I would have known you about and... four years back. I could have really used you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, what, you. <laughs> one, once I once I'd done that, Rob. Before that, I've worked. Uh, I've done some scripts for television and films and stuff like that. And I've kind of worked in like the system, you know, you know, the television film system, and that that worked fine because, like, you know, you get your paycheck and sort of thing, you know. Right. The it's a money. factory in a sense. Yeah, and it was great. The workflow. Know? Yeah, I mean, you know what money's coming in. It helped me buy a house. It was great. Right. But then, but then I go, okay, I'm going to do an independent thing, right? And after that, not, I'm never doing that again. So my hat is. Yeah. Up. I have the most respect. I know. I told her friend, if you wanted to do another one, the friendship was off. <laughs> <laughs> like, by the By the way, forgive me for forgive me if this question has been asked already, uh, but um, did we talk about uh, how you uh, Ansel, how you met the Dark Shadows cast? Did we Did we do that? Yeah, we, we, we thank you. Talked thank about you. yeah. Thank you. Sheer Go dumb ahead. luck. Yeah. Oh well, it paid off. It paid yeah, off. It did. It all it started did. with stalking them. No, I'm kidding. I'm just, ah! yeah. <laughs> He has a couple of stalkers, but we're not going to talk about Keith's stuff. No, we're not going to talk about my stuff. <laughs> oh, 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 whoa. Oh, now I'm finding out these things. Okay. No, I had a basically what Vicky's referring to is um, I did a horror film that did quite well. And um, and I did Fright Fest over here. And I did right. a, a talk and stuff like this in here in London. And then after this, I, there was this guy that would be out in front of my house and be like posters for me to sign. And then, then it was ch- a chainsaw and then it was a bat and then it was a machete. And I was like, yeah. I was like these had nothing to do with the film <laughs> that I worked on. Oh, you had a good one. But it was for like, uh, was sort oh, of like yeah. a whole year. It was for a whole year. This got rain, snow, sleet, sunny. Did he heat. want you to like, did he want to just submit a screenplay or something to you at one time too or something? Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, he had no talent that way. But I mean, I mean. It, <laughs> and it, then he told him that. he didn't have any talent. That was the problem. Well, it's lying to someone, <laughs> is it? So anyway, <laughs> enough about that. That's a, Keith, that's a I never knew. I'm sorry, Keith, but it's a good story. Yeah. Keith, I never knew. You acted in horror? You acted in the horror? No, film? no. I wrote. Um, I edited. I edited screenplays for I see. films I see. and television, and then wrote a couple of scripts. You know, I see. I see. The UK and the US sort of thing for a little while. No, I do have. I an, was. I, I do have an acting background, but that's back when I was a youngster, back before <laughs> I had a face for radio. So. <laughs> <laughs> and a voice, and a voice. Let's remember that. Uh, I still got my nasal twang, unfortunately. Yeah. I, I remember and this was many years ago. I was actually an extra in a low-budget horror film back in New York City. Somebody I somebody I worked with on my day job was a was an actor in that film. And the one thing, and I guess Ansel, you would probably identify with this. I never forgot it. It was a. I was just there for like one scene, and it was shot 
in on the an exterior shot, an outdoor, and you had to get through this restaurant to get to the garden, which they rented uh, during the day. And the one thing right. I never forgot, it was the makeup table. They had uh, all kinds of special effects on the makeup table, and it looked like uh, it looked like a it looked like a smorgasbord, you know. If you if, you know if you can actually think of that, only instead yeah. of bar mitzvah, you're looking at blood, uh, you know, like you know, like the blood right. in the can, and then the and then the uh, the, the prosthetics, and, and and another time it was it was I never forgot that. Yeah, no, well, you know, unfortunately, I've never had the budget to have a full-on makeup table. It's usually been me <laughs> painting the other actors. Um, but um, so, yeah, it's a real trip when you have to paint a scar on Jerry Lacey's forehead. You haven't lived. <laughs> what an honor! <laughs> well, you've done what Reverend Traff makeup. What I'm thinking, Angela, is I think someday when when you do have all the benefits of what you're working for. I think you're going to be brilliant, and I think you're going to be fantastic, and I cannot wait to see what comes out of your career. Thank you. Thank I hope you. you can hear me clapping. I, I can't. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. You are so knowledgeable, and, 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 and you know, and you've done so much in your young years. I'm just really impressed with you, and it, it takes a lot for me to be impressed. Trust me, as Keith, I'm, I'm a mean person. <laughs> no, no. Big talent, and you're literally a Horatio Alger story in a way. I mean, you're self-made, and definitely how many, a prodigy. And how can and how many people can you say about that in the business? Uh, where, but you know, it wasn't. It was really what you knew and how you applied it. And yes, you did right. get lucky, and you know as well. But <laughs> you had you had innate stuff that you were able to bring to the table. Yeah, I. I mean, I. I haven't really, it's not something I've really thought about, ever had a strategy. It's just been, I want to make movies. You have an instinct. And how, you know, what's what's the best movie I can make at this time? And how can I go do that? And just sort of figured it out from there. It's not a, there was no Dr. Mabuse master plan. No, there was, but there wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, I, I mean, thank you. I, I do appreciate you. you your kind words it's it does mean a lot i mean yeah. well deserved it's, well deserved thank you so um and so what we'll do is gonna let you carry on with your day and thank you for interviewing us but before we go where can people find you uh you can check out um almost all of my work um at my website uh www Hollinsworth productions not hollingsworth with a g hollingsworth h o l l I N S W O R T H Productions P R O D U C T I O N S dot com, um, and that's got uh, access to. You can buy the some of my films that are available on DVD, uh, some of my stuff that's on YouTube. Um, you can check out Will and Liz, which is streaming now on Amazon Prime, um, and um, you can you know keep and also on Facebook. I'm on Facebook, Hollinsworth Productions as well. Uh, I'm on Instagram. If you really want to look at my pictures of Venice Beach sunsets, uh, <laughs> I'm do. on Instagram. I miss Venice Follow- Beach. I will definitely look at your pictures on Instagram. <laughs> I'm on there. Uh, you get a picture of that my name. Guy. <laughs> I want a picture of the roller skating guy again. <laughs> Perry Perry. I'll go do He's around. He's always out there. I know. That just cracks me up that he's still there. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, he's 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 an institution. Like, we've oh, Venice Beach is God. changing. And so what's what's left that is still the original Venice Beach, we got to, like, hang on to. Because we have all yeah, these absolutely. tech companies coming in to. and ruining yeah. it. But, God, uh, but anyway, yeah. Uh, Hollandsworth Productions. I'm also, Hollandsworth Productions is also on Instagram. I'm on Instagram, Ansel Farage, A N S E L F A R A J. Should be able to find me, hopefully. Um, and uh, my YouTube channel is Hollinsworth Productions as well. And just keep uh, checking back on updates because I've got Loon Lake coming up, and that that's that's going to be a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun to make, and we're going to be. I'm watching. very proud of it. Absolutely, we're definitely watching Ansel. Oh yeah. Thank you. So it's goodbye from myself. Say goodbye, Vicky. Bye. Say goodbye, Tom. Take care, guys. And thank you so much, Ansel. And we'll be talking to you soon. Thank you guys for having me. It was fun. 
We are one planet. We share one extraordinary home. We are millions of wonders, but we are all one world. If we only get one chance to save our planet, to protect it for the next generation, then we have to take it. This is our chance. This is our fight. For our planet, for our home, for all of us. Join WWF today. Hello, welcome back to Dark Shadows, episode 72 to 91. So let's talk about what our favorite character was and our least favorite character of these episodes. And starting with you, Tom, who is your favorite character from episodes 72 to 91? And who is your least favorite character? I got to say, and I've been mentioning him a couple of times, I really think that George Matthews, who's a a veteran character actor and uh, had been in many, many TV shows, and he was also in some movies, uh, I think, in the 1940s. Uh, He only had one day on the show, but I think he really demonstrated uh, a a very good acting ability. Uh, He, you know, I think he played a very well uh, against Mitchell Ryan and Louis Edmonds and uh, and Joe Bennett, and uh, so I think that uh, you know, and so I mean, I, I make fun of the dandruff, but this is not to take away from a guy with a very, very varied career. And I will also add that the Honeymooners had a set of conventions in the 1980s uh, in New York, and uh, it was on Long Island because it was a very brief craze when the Lost episodes of Honeymooners were released by Jackie Gleason. And uh, George Matthews actually appeared at one of them. And he lived in South Carolina. And I remember him very well speaking up on the stage. He was almost ancient at that point. But you really got a sense of how intelligent this man was. Uh, He had a terrific range. And he could talk about a lot of things. And it was unbelievable that this guy could play the, you know, the Brooklyn brat uh, that you you saw there and also on Dark Shadows. So he's the best Mm -hmm. one. As far as uh, as far as I'm concerned, the worst one. Oh God, um, I got to say, I'm 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 really I'm really fishing for something. Uh, I you know I I think that uh, I just uh, you know Mitchell Ryan did what he had to do, but he was just so he just it was so obnoxious for me, you know. Uh, mm-hmm coming across as the guy who wanted everything and nobody could step in his way and, you know, and having the fights with, I'm, I'm, I'm only sorry that George Patterson didn't lock him up because he was, he was telling him that he was going to do anything and he would sue the world and nobody could stop him. Uh, Mitch yeah, Ryan played there, him was, well. there was an overbearingness to him. Yeah, overbearing. Mitch Ryan played him well. I just didn't like that. I just didn't like what they did with him. Because there was a softer side to Mitch Ryan, especially with Vicky, and you know, and and Vicky, of course, probably Vicky's strength was, I think, what attracted uh, Mitch uh, Burke to her, uh, because Vicky was this, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, Vicky could stand up to him at that particular point. I think he respected that, but she was not overbearing, and she wasn't a bully. She was just doing what she thought was right, and uh, mm-hmm. so. I don't like what the writers did with him. That would probably be my, uh, that probably would be my choice. And what about yourself, Vicky? What are your, what's you, your favorite character from this block and your least favorite? Oh, it's always going to be Louis Edmonds because he's just, he's, he's just a, he's such a cad and a reprobate, you know, and, but he does it with finesse, you know, and, he, and he's, 
you know, he's, he, he doesn't really guilty of a lot of stuff that's going on, but he always acts guilty. He just seems like there's something always going on in this, the back of this guy's mind, but he does it and he's just a joy to watch. I don't know why, maybe it's because he's obnoxious. I don't know. I kind of like that. He pulls, we all know. And um, it, as far as the as people kind of graded on my nerves, it was going back and forth between uh, uh, Carolyn and Vicky. She was either, you know, crying and whining too much, Victoria was, and then Carolyn, you know, being that typical female, you just want to bitch slap all the time. It's like, shut up, yeah. you know? <laughs> so, I mean, but I mean, I love them all dearly as characters, but I mean, as far as these episodes go, that would be my take. Um, personally, for myself, I quite liked Joe a lot this time. I finally we got a little bit of yeah. guts and balls behind Joe yeah, for the first time. Sack, finally. And we got a little, and I also like the simple fact that we got a little bit of um, colorization with his personality a little bit. It's like, you know, the moments with him and Maggie, and Maggie. you see his face light yes. up a little bit. And you saw some tenderness with him, but yet you saw some meat and you know you know some you know he stood up for himself you know that's backbone. what i liked but yeah we got a lot of backbone with joe and i quite like that i, I actually enjoyed joe and I, and I think that and also seeing what's blossoming between him and maggie really it kind of made me feel a bit warm inside because like yeah this works this actually works for me as far as the most the least favorite character has to be carolyn i don't I don't like what they've done to her character. I think right. this has to do down with the storylines, not the actress, of course. And the whole simple fact that she, the, the, the manipulation, I think if she was a bit more manipulative in a, um, a more sinister type of way, and you know, she kind of played people that wasn't so in your face, right. and a bit more clever, I think I would probably have enjoyed the whole jealousy game that she's playing with everyone. But because she's not doing that, and it's just so in your face, and the whole, I hate you, and I'm not talking to you, and the whole thing, it just, it's one of those people, yeah, I just, yeah, as, I'll, as you were saying about Victoria, I could, you just want to bitch slap her. It, it, it makes her very, very unlikable. There's, it just turns you really against her. It just her. gets a little, it's a kind of abrasive. Yeah, yeah and, and, you know, we, and we had episode 70, Two to ninety-one, with her doing that, all that through every single one of these episodes, almost. Yeah, yeah she was all over the place. They, yes. Yeah, yeah. I agree with you. I agree with you. So now uh, I'm going to swing things over because we have a little time on our hands. So, what's your overall thoughts of episode seventy-two to ninety-one of Dark Shadows? Starting with you, Vicky. Um, I like that it's starting to finally get the ball rolling because, you know, you got those first episodes, you know, you got to get to know the characters, you got to get to invest in them, you got to get the storylines going, you know, and so now you've got interest where like, okay, I'll only watch another episode. Now, if I'm going to watch two or three, I'll end up watching four or five because when you got them on Amazon Prime, they're 20 minutes. You don't have the commercials. You can bang through them babies, you know, and, and, and it's starting to set up for the next few episodes, I believe, that start probably in the 123 area, which is one mm. of where it really starts flying. And I can't wait to get going into that because it's a really cool storyline. I know Keith knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure Tom does. And uh, it just, you're starting to get vested in the characters. You see the setup and the storylines. And uh, I, I'm really glad that we get a chance to watch all these as opposed to just jumping into the Barnabas episodes because there really is so much that sets up everything before you get to Barnabas because there's so much more that happens and that's going on that, you know, you kind of jip yourself out of unless you don't watch them. You know, I know a lot of people don't have patience for it or whatever, but you do really start getting vested and wanting to keep watching them. Like, you know, I had to go back and rewatch these episodes because I banged them all out like a month ago. And so I had to go refresh my memory, but I mean, I, I really, I'm really enjoying them. I mean, I think they're, they add to the overall experience of watching dark shadows. And what about yourself, Tom? I couldn't agree with, I could not agree with you more, Vicki. Uh, and I, I think the, you know, I think that the beginning episodes are so important to watch. Uh, because it really gives you a new perspective from what you've mentioned, uh, from the outside scenery shots, uh, you know, the characters trying to find themselves, um, and, you know, and, and the transition uh, that we, you know, that, that we've discussed. This particular block of episodes, uh, I think 
they need, I think the writers needed a vacation from the uh, <laughs> <laughs> from the coroner's report. And, uh, oh, no kidding! Yeah, you know, so <laughs> so they, you know, so they just kind of like a few of the characters were on autopilot for a while, and mm -hmm. uh, but I but but once again. Uh, and, and, and I really do respect, they were trying to get their act together with the bloopers. And, and I do respect what they were doing. There were, there were scads mm -hmm. of episodes, with, you know, with this, it took like eight or nine episodes before you saw a blooper. And, uh, but it, it, paradoxically enough, you know, the bloopers are what makes the show, the bloopers are what, the, you know, are, is what makes it so endearing. It's uh, fine. I'm trying to play it so seriously. Uh, but for this particular block of episodes, um, you know, it's it, it's 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 a little slower, but you do have certain things happening uh, as a setup for stuff that's going to happen. Oh, and of course, the filigree pen, uh, yeah. which yeah. we have to remember, uh, Roger buries it in the in the backyard, so to speak. Uh, and, uh, and this whole Dumb business, ass. and this whole, <laughs> and this whole business, where, where where Vicky blames David for stealing it, and uh, you know, and, this, and Roger sticks up for David, which is an interesting thing because you know, does. yeah, yeah. I mean, Roger could have let David hang for that, and 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 chortled greedily in the background while David was getting it, but uh, but Roger stuck up for his son, uh, which is something that we. Again, that's a little bit of a character development, which we've started to see on Roger's part. Uh, so, you know, so in all, all in all, it's uh, it's worth watching because, as as a true fan, you know, you you enjoy the good stuff, and the mediocre stuff is going to happen like in any in any series, and you know that things are going to get better. But it wasn't terrible. It really wasn't terrible. No. Uh, and as far as for me goes, I found it not a lot really happens. I found there's some really magic moments within these episodes. You know, the part with Joe and Maggie, I really liked a lot. There's also some, there's some fun stuff we like with Roger, you know, trying to scare Victoria. And there's some, <laughs> and, and of course the ghost of Bill. <laughs> I love that though. I had to say I had to watch that twice. It's the first time I watched it, I started laughing. The second time I was like, "What the hell?" See, so, you know, and I, and I, for me, that's also makes it special. Um, I do think that, as you were saying before, and I agree with you, Tom, and with you, Vicky, is that there seems to be a lot of fumbling around about where we're going to go, yeah. sort of thing. And um, you know, maybe you know. But saying that, some of the dialogue is probably the best that we've seen in these episodes that we've seen from previous episodes. They've had some of the best dialogues going on between them and some really like emotions. And it seems like the, as far as the main characters go, well, all of the characters, actually they have some emotional depth with them. Or they're, they're actually delivering their lines like full, full troopers now, which is quite interesting to see. You know, they'll say hello and you actually, they, you actually feel like they mean it now. Kind of, <laughs> so. They're kind of overcoming their growing pains, you know? They're kind of yeah, getting sure. comfortable asserting sure. themselves in this, yeah. Well, some of the dialogue is probably the best that we've seen so far. Some of the dialogue that goes on here is really, really good. And I had to sit there and say, yeah, they do fumble around and Thinking back, it's like when we're putting the, this, you know, thinking about the shows, you know, for our listeners out here, you know, we watch these shows and then we go, okay, now we're going to discuss and we all take our little separate notes and stuff like this. And I have to sit there and say, I didn't, there wasn't a lot of notes, but saying that I can't sit there and say that I've seen just as many episodes in this, this block that I've done in all the other episodes. And I wasn't bored <laughs> at all. No, I was slightly no, irritated no. with some of the character developments, but that didn't, that didn't make me bored. You know, I, kept, I was very vested and interested in it. So I had to sit there and say, that's probably, you know, you have to take that down to the writers. I think the dark shadows writers, and I can't remember the guy who wrote these episodes. Was it Sawyer or something like that? Or Francis his, Swan. Francis Swan. Francis Swan. He's um, he wrote almost all, almost all these episodes. It's very rare. Yeah, he was working with Art Wallace. The two of them were working together at the time. You know, and I do think that I think Bar maybe what Dark Shadows might have um, suffered from is that normally within a TV series, when you write for TV series for people who 
you know, want to know what works on behind. You normally have a Bible, and what you have in the Bible is that you know we're going from point A to point B. Where I, I think with Dark Shadows, I think they were, I think they were chasing ratings, and they were also chasing um, viewership at the same time that they're wanting to give it their storyline. So I think that what they were doing is, they, I don't think they had a true Bible that they stuck to. It well, like they had they, to they step were, it up because they, they had, were going to get canceled. They had the Art Wallace Bible, and they were following that originally, but Dan Curtis was getting increasingly dissatisfied with it, which is why he hired Francis Swan uh, to kind of work could kind of work, and Francis Swan started to take it away from the original Art Wallace uh, Bible. You know, we talked about that. A number of things happened. Roger yeah. was killed off in the original uh, in the original Bible, and they they did, they stopped right. that from happening. Thank God. And uh, you know, there were you know, so there were there were a number of things. So they were so they were really um, hitting uh, un, uh, undiscovered country. Uh, in that they and you, and you can feel that going on in these episodes you can feel that's going through and uh, i mean like i said before i've started already on the next block because we are for our listeners out there we're doing two episodes in november of dark shadows and so therefore they're able to make sure met, you know when we record these i'm on time and make sure i've read everything i've been up to date with these so i started a little bit early to fit them in you still and, watching you know, yeah, still it watching it. But actually, last night I watched it on the sofa. I watched ten episodes while sitting on the sofa after work, and I stayed awake. I normally fall asleep when I come home from work for about an hour. So yeah, I didn't do my old man thing. I actually would, and actually kept me interested. So we got a lot to talk about next month. I'm really excited to say. But I do, you know, I do like that these episodes. You do got a little bit. You got all the little things that are being mentioned that don't look like they mean anything are do mean something in what's coming up next month for us. So. So I have to say, and I have to say that Swan's writing dialogue is probably the strong, is, the, is what makes these um, episodes really strong. I think he's a strong dialogue writer. Plotting wise, uh, but as far, as far as dialogue goes, they're some of the best dialogue I've heard in Dark, Sh- Dark Shadows so far. So I guess that winds us up with Dark Shadows episode 72 to 91. Make sure that you come down to our webpage, which is www.llpodcast.com, and sign up to our subscriber newsletter list, where you find everything that's new and exciting going on with Dark Shadows, and we give you one newsletter per month, so we don't fill your junk mail or any of your emails with useless information and bombard you with it. Um, next um, episode, we'll be do, coming back to our Edgar Allan Poe, where we'll be covering Stonehurst Asylum. And then our course, that'll be our month of November, we'll be going into. Also, you make sure you follow us on our social media, which is www.facebook uh, slash literary pod. Or you can find us on Twitter at Literary License Podcast. Or you can find us on Tumblr, which is Lit Pod as well um YouTube so and Spreaker. oh yes and make sure that you listen to us on Spreaker and we're also on YouTube thank you Vicky my brain is dying after a long and if we've her. missed the platform <laughs> please inform us because we think we just about got them all covered now yeah we seem to be on everything at the moment so thank you for, and thank you for all our listeners for sticking with us and hope you all enjoyed our Halloween happy Halloween wishes to all our thankful um, subscribers and listeners so this leads us to the end of Dark Shadows, where we're left with some very serious questions, such as, will Vicky ever find out who her mother is? Will Carolyn ever get banged with Burke up in Banger? Right. Or, <laughs> well, she or get banged you know, banger. <laughs> will she get banged in Banger? Tom has a dirty mind today. Or will they have bangers in Banger? <laughs> or will, will Sam ever pay his, Will Sam ever pay his bar tab? You know, it's so many things we got coming up. Absolutely. Will, will Burke learn to be kinder? <laughs> we'll never know. We'll, we'll, we'll find out for more episodes and more in our two episodes of Dark Shadows, which will be in the final two weeks of November. If you want any more information, make sure you go to our um, webpage at www.llpodcast.com. It will have all the information and the breakdowns of all the episodes that we'll be covering. So that leads us to our end of our episode. So good night, Tom. Good night and happy Halloween, everybody. (laughs) (laughs) Good night, Vicky. Good night, everybody. I'm not even going to try to do the laugh. (laughs) I'll teach you. Don't worry. (laughs) And well, Vicky does have a cackle. That's what most witches have. (laughs) 
Shut up. <laughs> off my ass. Stay off my Facebook. <laughs> uh, what can I say? Uh, it is good night for myself. And we'll talk to you next episode for The Dark Shadows 92 to 127. Thank you Close and enough. good night. Night, everybody. Night. Darling, what in the world happened to upset you so? When you left here to drive Vicky into town, you were as happy as a lord. I know. I was. Well, then something must have happened. I'd really rather just forget about it. Well, can you? No. Well, no, I can't. Then I think you better tell me what it is. All right, I'll tell you. It's about Miss Victoria Winters. Vicky? I don't understand. Of course you don't. I don't either. All I know is that this girl you trusted so much that you practically begged to stay here at Collinwood what and not... What about her? Right now, she's with Burke Devlin. You got a new girlfriend But I still love you I can't stand the thought of her Having a piece of you She got that I don't But she do that I
Seven nine half that pretty much of this house and stuff knives into my uncle Robert. And don't tell me you didn't know about it because I heard you were there. Yes, helping him, giving him an alibi. Oh, sure. That was that night. And then suddenly you switch. You decide to play the other side of the fence. That isn't true. Whose side are you on anyway, Vicky? Nobody's. I'm just trying to do my job, that's all. Don't play innocent with me. Not ten minutes ago, I looked out my window and saw you and Burke Devlin driving up to this house. I saw him in town. He insisted on driving me home. You knew, didn't you, that my mother didn't want him up here anymore? Or my uncle? I tried to talk him out of it. What were you doing talking to him at all? Vicky, you were hired to give my little nephew his school lessons, not to play footsie with the man who wants to put my uncle in prison. 